Buongiorno, buon pomeriggio a tutti. Eh, abbiamo dovuto attendere anche per la diretta, siamo in streaming, e quindi ehm, era importante diciamo, seguire i tempi. Um, uh, for the English uh, speakers, uh, I apologize, I will uh, um, call my um, presentation in uh, Italian, but uh, uh, my slides are in English, so I'm sure this will help. And uh, more or less, that's what also the others will do. Um, I welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here in Milan during the Milan Fashion Week. It's a great opportunity to talk about uh, uh, a slower fashion, more sustainable fashion right here in the middle of the Milan Fashion District. And also very close to our uh, recently opened uh, concept store, Sustainable Friends. It's just uh, a few steps from here in Galleria Passarella 1. And that's also kind of a challenge uh, to uh, raise awareness on uh, sustainability issues in fashion uh, here again in the middle of the uh, Milan Fashion District. So um, today we are going to talk about sustainable fashion. We're going to also uh, learn from uh, brands from uh, literally all over the world, from the US and uh, from uh, uh, many other places, Italy, Switzerland, Sweden, etc., etc. Uh, uh, sto parlando in, in inglese, ma eh, adesso comincio a parlare in italiano per i, i nostri ospiti in italiano. Uh, o forse se volete faccio un'indagine, chi è che preferisce che parlo in inglese? Ok, chi preferisce che parlo in italiano? Nessuna preferenza? Ok, parlo in italiano, ok, mi sembra anche giusto, siamo in Italia, è anche giusto eh, onorare la nostra lingua. Dunque, um, vi parlo un po' anche della nostra realtà, noi siamo uh, un'organizzazione che da moltissimi anni si occupa di conservazione, di certificazione, io in particolare da oltre 30 anni, e, um, in questo contesto siamo diciamo, un gruppo di realtà, di attività, aziende, profit, non profit e tra queste c'è la nostra fondazione, la World Sustainability Foundation che si occupa di eh, gestire i progetti di conservazione eh, in oltre 40 paesi nel mondo che sono a volte eh, iniziati e gestiti proprio dalla fondazione, altre volte sono selezionati e supportati. Questi sono i progetti eh, sotto il cappello Friend of the Earth, diciamo che fanno parte del programma Friend of the Earth, il cui focus è quello di eh, mh, proteggere e conservare le specie più in pericolo, gli habitat più in pericolo. E questi sono i progetti... Funziona più? Mm. Non funziona il... Questo, ok, adesso funziona. <ride> okay. E questi sono i progetti Friend of the Sea che hanno come obiettivo principale, come mission, quello di proteggere eh, le specie acquatiche più in pericolo e anche gli habitat più in pericolo. Sono progetti, vari progetti, ve ne menziono solo un paio, che proteggono sia le specie più piccole, come ad esempio le farfalle, la popolazione media delle farfalle in alcuni paesi, secondo alcuni studi, si è ridotta del 50%, poi ci sono casi estremi come la monarca occidentale nell'America del Nord che sembra essersi ridotta di oltre il 90%, quindi è importante sensibilizzare, cercare di proteggere i loro habitat, far conoscere queste specie che sono, fra l'altro hanno una biodiversità incredibile, affascinante, attraverso un progetto di citizen science attraverso il quale chiunque può con il proprio cellulare fotografare una farfalla vicino e inviarla a noi, noi la classificheremo, la inseriamo nella mappa interattiva che abbiamo sul nostro sito e alla fine di ogni anno produciamo uno studio con l'obiettivo di eh, sensibilizzare e anche di eh, proteggere queste specie incredibili. Fino a progetti invece che mirano a proteggere le specie più grandi, perlomeno nell'ambito delle specie animali, eh, come le balene, eh, la cui eh, principale causa di mortalità ormai sono le eh, collisioni accidentali con eh, le grandi navi cargo, eh, 
con le navi da crociera che portano ad una mortalità di circa 20.000 individui ogni anno, quindi lo stesso livello delle prese accessorie nella attività di pesca. Pensate che invece la pesca alla balena ne uccide solo 1.000 ogni anno, solo, tra virgolette, quindi diciamo un impatto nettamente superiore. Quindi noi abbiamo sviluppato tutta una serie di attività che in alcuni casi hanno anche portato ad alcuni successi come in Sri Lanka dove alcune linee di eh, trasporto hanno deciso di eh, diciamo, cambiare rotta per ridurre il rischio di impatto. Ma Friend of the Sea e Friend of the Earth sono anche due eh, importanti certificazioni eh, di sostenibilità a livello internazionale focalizzati inizialmente nella certificazione dei prodotti alimentari sostenibili secondo i nostri requisiti e poi estesa ad altri settori. E hanno proprio questa particolarità di essere orizzontali sui vari settori, sui varie tipologie di prodotti e di servizi, tanto da riuscire a coprire tutta la gamma di prodotti eh, alimentari, non alimentari e servizi. Ve ne eh, descrivo solo alcuni. Ormai abbiamo oltre 1500 aziende con prodotti certificati in più di 80 paesi nel mondo. Siamo cresciuti molto per esempio nella certificazione dei eh, supplementi Omega 3 eh, con il logo Friend of the Sea, le, nella cosmesi, le creme UV che non impattano il, la barriera corallina, diciamo io ve lo descrivo riassumendo, ma ovviamente i requisiti sono molto più dettagliati. E anche il sale è sostenibile, perché il sale in certe zone può avere un determinato impatto. Oltre che tutta un'altra serie di certificazioni riguardo il turismo sostenibile, quindi dalle spiagge ai resort agli acquari, come in questo caso. E sotto invece il programma, all'interno del programma di certificazione Friend of the Earth, oltre ad altri standard che abbiamo sviluppato, è stato sviluppato lo standard per la moda sostenibile, quindi sia il prodotto, il, il, la fibra tessile che eh, il prodotto finito, gli abiti, il brand eventualmente che rispetta tutta una serie di requisiti di sostenibilità. E, il progetto ha avuto un buon successo e vi parlerò un pochettino più nel dettaglio successivamente, ma eh, è per questo che oggi sono qua per parlarvi di moda sostenibile a livello generico e spero di riuscire a portarvi anche alcuni dati utili, interessanti eh, relativamente all'impatto, alle iniziative, a, diciamo, il trend a livello di sensibilità del consumatore, eccetera. Bene, vediamo che eh, la moda è cresciuta notevolmente, eh, è circa raddoppiata dall'inizio del 2000 ad adesso, in soli 20-23 anni, è raddoppiato in termini di fatturato globale. Una crescita che non ha uguali, diciamo, nelle, come dire, nei, nei prodotti di largo consumo. Infatti, se vediamo in basso la popolazione, è cresciuta di circa il 20% nello stesso periodo, invece il il consumo, la produzione alimentare e di energia è cresciuta ecco, di circa il 40%, mentre il, gli acquisti e la produzione alimentare è cresciuta eh, ad un tasso notevolmente superiore. Questo perché eh, evidentemente eh, di alimentari, anche se il nostro benessere cresce, come vediamo il GDP, il prodotto mondiale, la produzione mondiale è cresciuta notevolmente negli ultimi anni. Eh, il, il consumo alimentare diciamo, ha un limite, oltre un tot non possiamo mangiare, ecco, pro capite. Mentre il consumo di vestiti ha quasi, è quasi senza limite, nel senso che è quello che sta succedendo proprio che compriamo al di là di quella che è la nostra effettiva esigenza e necessità. E infatti di conseguenza mentre è aumentato come dicevo nel, nel grafico precedente la produzione globale è circa raddoppiata il numero di volte che utilizziamo il prodotto, l'abito, la, la t-shirt, i pantaloni che compriamo 
è eh, in media si è ridotto notevolmente. Si parla di una riduzione di circa un quarto, il 25%, insomma. E dove stanno tutti questi abiti? Stanno nei cassetti che poi dopo non riusciamo più a svuotare. E perché è successo questo? Perché, diciamo, nel mondo della moda c'è una forte concorrenza, ci sono agglomerati di aziende molto potenti che hanno un grande potenziale anche di marketing e, e quindi eh, l'obiettivo è diventato di far comprare sempre di più anche le cose che non sono necessarie, abbassando anche i prezzi e eh, aumentando il numero di, di cicli, di stagioni, che una volta erano solo due diciamo, fino a, cam a cambiare il prodotto e a suggerire al consumatore nuovi prodotti ogni settimana praticamente, 50 volte all'anno. Infatti ci sono aziende diciamo, che hanno proprio il record nella loro capacità di proporre rapidamente nuovi eh, abiti, nuovi capi, nuovi look. Eh, si era iniziato agli, a, nel 2000 con Zara e H&M che sono stati diciamo, i precursori di questo tipo di Uh, attività di marketing fino ad arrivare agli attuali shine eccetera che eh, hanno una capacità sempre maggiore di proporre nuovi abiti eh, e questo ovviamente ha il suo impatto in più c'è il fattore internet perché immaginatevi che ormai quasi il 50% degli acquisti avviene su internet e tutti lo sper abbiamo sperimentato probabilmente noi stessi eh, la tendenza è quella, diciamo, a un acquisto più facile, magari senza ragionarci troppo, eccetera. E quindi anche questo ha portato a un aumento dei consumi. Nel frattempo cosa è successo? Che mentre alla fine del Novecento la fibra principale era ancora il cotone, a livello produttivo, di utilizzo, quindi negli abiti, da allora c'è stata una crescita enorme della produzione di poliestere. Come dirò, mh, non dobbiamo demonizzare nessun prodotto, questo comunque ha consentito anche di abbassare eh, i prezzi e permettere anche al, diciamo, alle famiglie meno abbienti di eh, avere a un, un valore diciamo, ehm, adeguato, accessibile, un, di che vestirsi. In più c'è da considerare il fatto che c'è una sproporzione enorme tra alcune nazioni ed altre in termini di quanto viene acquistato. Per cui mentre la Cina si sì, risulta, perché ha una grossissima popolazione, essere il leader nel, nell'acquisto, nel consumo di, di vestiti, di abiti, eh, il, bisogna tenere in considerazione che per esempio un cinese confrontato a, con un americano medio probabilmente anche con un europeo, soprattutto nei paesi del nord che risultano essere quelli di maggior consumo. C'è la Svezia qua, eh? c'è anche un rappresentante svedese. It's one of the highest consumption uh, country in, uh, in Europe in terms of number of uh, looks that are bought. And uh, uh, in, uh, on average, in, in media, un, un cinese consum, uh, diciamo, acquista un quarto dei vestiti che acquista un americano medio, probabilmente anche un europeo. E tutto questo acquistare esponenziale, produrre in maniera esponenziale, ovviamente ha un suo impatto sull'ambiente. Ehm, ci sono diverse cifre, a volte più o meno attendibili, le potete leggere qua, e ovviamente essendo una delle industrie principali insieme a quella dell'energia e a quella della eh, produzione alimentare è normale perché noi ci dobbiamo cibare, ci dobbiamo vestire ha un impatto notevole a livello globale e questo impatto non si vede bene in questo slide ma dietro c'è una mappa eh, qua c'è l'Asia Asia is here Europe and North America and Africa are here. Unfortunately, they don't show on the slide for some unknown reason. 
ma eh, la produzione normalmente avviene nei paesi in via di sviluppo, in particolare in Asia, dove avviene anche la maggior parte dell'impatto in termini di inquinamento rispetto ai paesi dove si consuma. Ci sono quindi i casi classici, eh, diciamo più eclatanti, come quello del eh, lago Aral in, eh, in Asia, dove la produzione di cotone in uh, Uzbekistan e in Turk Turkmenistan ha mh, portato a diciamo, una riduzione notevole della portata dei fiumi verso il lago e quindi il, eh, la, la superficie effettiva del lago, il, il volume d'acqua, si è andato a ridurre, a ridurre notevolmente fino a, a raggiungere una situazione critica. Il problema poi di inquinamento delle acque, questa è una città in Indonesia dove eh, si è, è concentrata una grossa produzione eh, tessile e le tinture poi ve, vengono, venivano anche, soprattutto anche in passato riversate nei fiumi portando appunto a un impatto notevole in termini di inquinamento. Ma eh, se analizziamo il totale delle fibre che vengono utilizzate, abbiamo visto il trend, quindi una grossa crescita del poliestere, eh, in generale delle fibre sintetiche, mentre le altre hanno mantenuto un andamento costante, le possiamo suddividere in quelle che normalmente vengono definite fibre naturali e quelle che vengono definite fibre artificiali, fatte dall'uomo. Quindi ovviamente le fibre dall'agricoltura, diciamo, e le fibre sintetiche. Ora esistono diversi indici, diversi indici, l'indice di Higgs è stato anche criticato, è stato anche criticato, però in generale, eh, diciamo, tutti gli studi, questi si nota anche quando si, si analizzano gli studi relativi al packaging, per esempio, dove si parla di fibre dall'agricoltura, diciamo, o della silvicoltura, come la carta, il cartone o il vetro, lo si compara alla plastica a livello di eh, ciclo di vita di tutto il prodotto, quindi dalla fase di estrazione, trasformazione, distribuzione, eccetera, risulterebbe che comunque le fibre sintetiche hanno un eh, impatto totale inferiore rispetto alle fibre dall'agricoltura, perché ovviamente fibre dell'agricoltura necessitano di tanta acqua, avrete visto anche voi le, le statistiche, si vedevano prima, di tanta acqua per la produzione e di eh, energia eh, e a volte utilizzano anche dei materiali plastici per essere prodotti, perché se tu devi portare il fertilizzante per far crescere il cotone, tu devi portare in dei sacchi di plastica, per cui la conclusione è che non bisogna demonizzare nessun eh, fibra anche perché non ha nessuna utilità, perché alcune fibre sono lì, continueranno ad esserci. L'importante è, è diciamo, sensibilizzare, motivare e eh, fare il possibile per ridurre l'impatto di ogni fibra. Non scordiamoci che la plastica, per esempio, nel medicale ha una presenza fondamentale, così come nei trasporti è riuscita a ridurre l'inquinamento con delle auto più leggere, eccetera. Quindi ci sono sempre degli aspetti positivi e negativi. Noi come Friend of the Sea, Friend of the Earth, sempre ci poniamo, diciamo, proponiamo delle, dei valori basati su dati scientifici, non solo diciamo, su conclusioni emotive e emozionali. Quindi è importante eh, esaltare gli aspetti positivi di tutte le fibre e evidenziare quelli negativi e cercare di eh, migliorarle. Lo sappiamo, la plastica eh, quando viene lavata, utilizzata, può avere un impatto in termini di microplastiche, quindi questo è un problema che deve essere affrontato. Dal punto di vista sociale, ovviamente la produzione del, delle fibre e del, dei prodotti della moda ha un impatto, ne abbiamo sentito parlare tutti, diciamo, di anche avvenimenti più eclatanti. E, eh, non starò qua a elencarvi tutti i dettagli, ma è ovvio che stiamo parlando di paesi dove il costo dei lavoratori è estremamente basso e molto spesso non raggiunge diciamo, il livello suffici sufficiente per sopravvivere. 
stiamo parlando di 3 dollari al giorno, quindi questo di per sé vi descrive la problematica di base, tra, diciamo, senza tralasciare poi quelle che sono diciamo, le situazioni più estreme di eh, sfruttamento minorile, eh, di mancanza anche di eh, misure di sicurezza, come evidenziato poi da eh, situazioni estreme come Rana Plaza, eccetera. Che cosa dicono i consumatori? I consumatori, grazie a internet, alle informazioni più diffuse, sono sempre più sensibili a, a questo tema. Eh, ovviamente eh, la sensibilità cambia anche un po' da nazione a nazione, da generazione a generazione. E quindi vediamo che nelle diverse capitali del mondo la sensibilità può cambiare, ma eh, più o meno sono oltre il 50% è convinto che eh, la, la, la problematica di impatto nella industria della moda eh, sia una questione rilevante della quale loro sono particolarmente preoccupati e la eh, generazione più giovane diciamo è quella che è più sensibile a questo tema che forse ne ha saputo di più si è informata poi vediamo anche che la definizione di sostenibilità eh, varia da consumatore a consumatore è un concetto piuttosto complesso per cui alcuni danno più valore al fatto che il prodotto duri nel tempo, che è un aspetto che raramente poi si, si va a verificare, anche perché è più complicato verificarlo, quanto dura un prodotto nel tempo. Altri sono più preoccupati relativamente all'utilizzo meno di sostanze chimiche, non solo nella produzione, ma anche poi potrebbero rimanere sul indumento stesso altri particolarmente preoccupati all'aspetto etico del lavoratore, eccetera, eccetera. Quindi è un tema complesso, e dobbiamo affrontarlo come tale. Poi, eh, quando gli si chiede al consumatore se sono disponibili a pagare qualcosa di più, almeno sulla carta, perché poi c'è sempre grossa differenza tra il questionario e poi eh, la situazione pratica, sembra che ci sia una buona parte è disposta a pagare fino a 10-20% di più. E, eh, comunque sia il 60% dice che se il prezzo è uguale preferisco quello sostenibile o comunque certificato verificato piuttosto che quello non. Un'ultima slide sui consumatori. Eh, il la domanda è relativa all'utilizzo di una certificazione. Può essere utile l'utilizzo di una certificazione sul prodotto e eh, diciamo che c'è un più del 50% fino all'80% che è convinto che sia necessaria, che sia importante, che possa aiutare. Quindi cosa è successo? C'è un problema, il consumatore è sensibile, ovviamente le aziende hanno cominciato a darsi da fare anche i grossi gruppi, come vedete, per mettere in atto delle iniziative per almeno dichiarare che stanno riducendo l'impatto. Sicuramente alcuni lo fanno e anche in maniera seria. Uno studio recente dice che il, 39, il 40% dei eh, brand, dei... dei grossi stilisti eccetera sta eh, cominciando a, a fare delle dichiarazioni di sostenibilità lo stesso studio eh, ha stabilito che circa il 60 di queste dichiarazioni non sono sostanziate eh, diciamo basate su effettive certificazioni di terza parte e che eh, più o meno lo stesso valore il 60 non ehm, risponde ai requisiti minimi della normativa in atto negli, nel Regno Unito. Ed è per questo che l'Unione Europea ha introdotto una nuova normativa, regolamenti, eccetera, atti a motivare le aziende a migliorarsi, ve lo dico in poche parole, diciamo è molto complesso 
diciamo, tutto il, il testo e quello che è stato eh, deciso, ma a motivare le aziende a migliorarsi e eh, allo stesso tempo a ehm, evitare il greenwashing, in poche parole. Quindi i claims devono essere sostanziati da certificazioni di terza parte, da certificazioni indipendenti attraverso degli audit esterni. Esistono già diverse certificazioni nel mondo della moda, queste sono solo alcune, alcune sono generiche a livello aziendale, come B Corp, altre sono più specifiche come Global Organic Textile Standard, GOTS, ma limitate in questo caso solo ai prodotti che derivano da fibre certificate bio. E poi eh, Ecotex, Ecotex, eccolo qua, eh, che è un'altra un certificazione molto conosciuta, che però è molto specifica per la fase di trasformazione e guarda meno alla fase di estrazione. E poi c'è il nuovo entrato, eh, che sta avendo molto successo, l'upcycling, che eh, può essere in qualche modo regolamentato, certificato da Global Recycled Standard o altre simili, e che, come tutti sapete, significa riutilizzare materiali che altrimenti verrebbero scartati, senza riciclarli, senza rigenerarli, ma proprio ri riutilizzando i pezzi di materia prima. E ha una, una crescita prevista un raddoppio nel giro di pochi anni, di una decina d'anni. Il nostro ruolo come Friend of the Earth è stato quello di sviluppare uno standard che fosse onnicomprensivo, che potesse abbracciare un po' tutte le varie iniziative che vanno verso una riduzione dell'impatto, un rispetto dei lavoratori. E quindi eh, consideri anche Ehm, parzialmente equivalenti delle altre certificazioni qualora l'azienda o il prodotto avesse già queste altre certificazioni che vedete qua sotto e che quindi andasse a coprire tutte le varie possibili situazioni come ad esempio chi utilizza una materia prima da produzione agricola bio o sostenibile a lotta integrata, global gap una trasformazione già certificata verificata essere pulita diciamo o chi utilizza prodotti da rigenerati in upcycling e verifichiamo anche la responsabilità sociale perché sempre andiamo a verificare questo aspetto in tutti i nostri standard perché non vogliamo che il nostro logo vada su un prodotto e poi eh, magari prodotti in maniera sostenibile ma poi non rispettoso dei lavoratori quindi questo è quello che proponiamo ehm, nel contesto di tutti gli altri standard che abbiamo sviluppato. Per questo che invito se è qua, eh, perlomeno forse è occupata nell'organizzazione con i modelli. Naomi? Ok, c'era il dubbio? Ok. Eh, presenterò io per lei. Naomi è il nostro responsabile di progetto, la conoscerete dopo, sta gestendo i modelli e la parte che vedrete dopo durante il cocktail, eh, la responsabile del progetto Moda di Friend of the Earth. Abbiamo una pagina web dedicata dove potete trovare tutte le informazioni, in particolare dove troverete anche eh, gli standard con le varie checklist, i requisiti che sono pubblici. Ehm, e che sono impostati come vi descrivevo, quindi ci sono degli standard specifici per l'agricoltura, qualora la materia prima derivasse dall'agricoltura, e poi nello standard qua sotto trovate comunque una, uh, dei requisiti che sono applicabili alle varie situazioni, anche di upcycling, uh, rigenerazione della materia prima, uh, qualora il prodotto non derivasse dall'agricoltura. Il progetto è cresciuto nel corso degli ultimi un anno e mezzo, diciamo 18 mesi, e quasi 50 aziende hanno aderito da diverse parti del mondo, 
credo che siano circa da 12 nazioni in quattro continenti e questo non può che farci piacere, forse la formula è la formula anche adatta e sappiamo che il nostro ruolo non finisce con la fase di certificazione ma che dobbiamo poi eh, promuovere, creare network perché è così che si sviluppa la sostenibilità. Ci sono delle certificazioni che terminano nel momento della certificazione, invece noi riteniamo che qualora il brand, il prodotto sia certificato è importante anche supportarlo, aiutarlo e fare network e quindi eh, abbiamo comunicato la certificazione di, queste, di questi brand e siamo riusciti negli ultimi 18 mesi a essere menzionati in uh, alcune diciamo, bibbie della moda nelle, nei media più conosciuti. Li portiamo anche alle fiere dove li presentiamo nel contesto del nostro stand, siamo stati a Pure London, andremo a White a settembre, li promuoviamo anche nel nostro concept store che è proprio qua a due passi, Sustainable Friends, dove svolgiamo anche nella parte superiore interviste a eh, professionisti della, della moda da, di tutte le origini. E poi a settembre organizziamo eh, delle sfilate dove anche lì sensibilizziamo, informiamo sul tema e dove invitiamo i brand a esporre eh, i, i, propri, eh, i propri look. Questa è l'ultima che abbiamo tenuto a Milano a settembre. Ovviamente ci sono parecchie informazioni nel nostro sito, su YouTube, eccetera, con i vari video dei brand e anche delle sfilate. Io con questo vi ringrazio, alla fine ci sarà un momento di domande e risposte, quindi siete tutti invitati a esporre le vostre domande, dubbi, eccetera. Eh, per ora eh, passo la parola a il il prossimo speaker che è qui con noi è Sara Rosberg, founder and CEO di Transforming Textiles. Prego Sara. <susurra> In a world where style meets sustainability, there's a revolutionary fabric making waves, sense tex. Brought to life by Transforming Textiles AB in Sweden, this five-fiber yarn thread mixture is not just a fabric, it's a game changer. Sense tex is more than just a textile, it's a breakthrough born from challenging times. Inspired by the 2020 pandemic, where health became paramount, sense tex emerged as a fabric with a mission. Crafted with two conductors, silver and zinc oxide, and three natural fibers, Raimi, soybean, and sea cell, Sensetex is a perfect blend of comfort and protection. Let's dive deeper into these incredible fibers. Sea cell fibers bring eco-friendliness to a new level, while smart cell fibers with zinc oxide protect your skin, making Sensetex ideal for sensitive skin and promoting health. Imagine your clothes not just being stylish, but smart too. Sensetex, when integrated with sensors, becomes a real-time health monitor, a fashion-forward smart textile. We care about the planet as much as you do. Sensetex is a front-runner in sustainability, reducing water and chemical usage. And by 2030, we're introducing a smart factory for fully circular recycling. Enter Modality, our fashion brand, proving that style and sustainability can coexist. Three verticals, fashion, healthcare, and space, all powered by Sensetex innovation. Collaboration is at our core. We've partnered with Vital Probing to integrate Vitals Track, offering real-time vital sign monitoring for healthcare applications, both inpatient and remote. We're expanding our horizons in the United States, engaging in research and development projects for federal and healthcare sectors. Stay tuned for more exciting developments. 
Join us in transforming textiles and fashion as we redefine what it means to wear your values. Follow our journey on and shop at. Because when you wear Sense Tex, you're not just wearing a fabric, you're wearing a commitment to a greener, healthier, and more stylish future. And uh, thank you, Paolo, for an amazing presentation before me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Rosberg, and uh, welcome to this presentation on the topic of fashion and tech enhancing health. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Transforming Textiles, but I am also the innovator of uh, SenseTex, our new five fiber uh, yarn thread textile technology that I'm going to talk about today. And uh, today I will tell you about our journey with starting Transforming Textiles and also how we created the SenseTex technology uh, and used it to uh, enhance health. And here you can see our gorgeous model wearing uh, an example of what SenseTex looks like. So uh, you can cue the <laughs> cue the presentation. It's uh, we're just waiting for the slide. Oh oh, I press. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, I blame it on jet lag. Right. So imagine that there was a textile with health enhancing abilities embedded into its fibers that improves your health while you're wearing it. A textile that is both washable, circular, and sustainable. And when connected to sensors, it can function just like a smartwatch. This is what we do at Transforming Textiles. We create textile technologies for the future. So our organization structure varies from other companies. Uh, we operate in three main verticals uh, at the same time. Those being fashion through our fashion brand modality, healthcare and space. But we also uh, establish subsidiaries for armed forces, innovation, and recycle facilities. We operate in all three verticals and more to create an industrial, manufacturing, recycling, and system change. Although they seem far apart, they are connected. We believe that this interdisciplinary uh, approach and multidimensional thinking will create the system changes we need for a sustainable future. And here you can see uh, pictures of our uh, amazing team uh, working to achieve our goals. Uh, their skills span from everything from space engineering to textile engineering and material sciences. And to help us further, uh, we also have a great executive advisory team uh, that you can read more about uh, all of us on our website. So how did it all begin and why are we doing this? It all began in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. My mother was isolated in an elderly home at what was to become the end of her life. Due to the restrictions, me and many others were unable to see our loved ones in care. I lost time with her, and so did my children. I also asked myself, what if there was a better way to protect our loved ones that would not result in increasing the waste mountain with disposable tests, masks, and bottles? And <laughs> that could that would provide real-time answers to virus symptoms through a t-shirt instead of those disposable tests. This is where the idea was born. I teamed up with a space engineer called Marcelo Bolt to create an MVP prototype uh, with sensors that signal to your mobile when you were infected or showing virus symptoms. We then connected with Tahir Heitiglu, a manufacturing and supply sourcing specialist from Turkey, and together we created Sensex, a five-fiber yarn never before created. And this is a quote from our first top-tier publication in CEO Weekly, written by Paul Stewart, where he describes Sensex. Sensex, a breakthrough five-fiber yarn blend with two conductors and three natural fibers that seamlessly integrate style, functionality, and sustainability. This fabric a dual purpose textile not only offers protection against chemicals, viruses, and bacteria, but also serves as a foundation to tech advancement in fashion and health. So what is SenseTex then in simple terms? It is where style and functionality meet sustainability all in one. And in technical terms, SenseTex is defined as a multifunctional conductive and biodegradable ring yarn produced from a mixture of different properties. 
And those properties are, like you can see here, smart cell, which is zinc oxide, which protects you from UVA and UVB rays. It also is skin friendly and protects you from, uh, well, if you have eczema, for example, or psoriasis or other skin conditions. Rami is anti-mold and uh, anti-mildew protection and also protection from bacteria, to name a few. The silver has anti-static uh, abilities, thermal, conduct <laughs> thermal conductivity, tricky word, uh, and bacteria protection. Uh, the soybean protects you from Staphylococcus aureus and germ germs and also has antibacterial properties. The sea cell, which stems from algae, is, has rich antioxidants and vitamins, is biodegradable and skin friendly. And all of these fibers are listed on our website if you want to deep dive into them. To cater for the different needs, we had to create three different versions of SenseTax. Uh, they vary in degree of conductivity and are suitable for different technical applications. So here you can find the three different compositions in quality A, B, and C. So how does SenseTax then stand out? It's multifunctional. It has a unique yarn structure, and it's eco-friendly and sustainable. We are proud to have received a certification from Friends of the Earth and Sea, which uh, we are very, very proud of. We also gained a seal of material excellence by the Material Connections Lab in New York City just recently. SenseTex combines comfort and health. Zinc oxide emphasizes regenerative skincare and hygiene. It is smooth and silky fabric for those seeking comfort, style, and sustainability. Oh, something happened, Paolo. <laughs> oh, there we go. That was it. Um, overall, SenseTex provides bacteria and virus protection while being more resistant to moist and humidity. It is produced with no chemicals. It lasts three times longer than cotton and can be washed in high temperatures such as 70 degrees with 80 degrees tumble dry. So what other problems are we solving with SenseTex? Apart from improving your health through all the use of benefits, we also solve problems on a bigger scale. The first one being time. The lack of real-time answers during the pandemic was a big critical point in which this innovation solves. The textile landfill and water scarcity problem are all known, and due to us, not having, <laughs> or us having a circular and sustainable production with less water use, we uh, address this problem as well. And in addition to this, the material requires less washing due to its antiseptic abilities. SenseTex enables a new different kind of mechanical recycling process due to its innovative bifiber construction. It enables the yarn to be unspun in a new smart way. And here you can see some of our sector collaborators that we are currently working with. And we also have a partner technology with a company called Vitalprobe and their new sensor called Vitalstrack to merge in healthcare and uh, to merge with SenseTex for healthcare in space. It is a cost-effective scalable sensor solution that will uh, uh, <laughs> ensure multiple patient monitoring with over 20 parameters measured and continuous, uh, continuous tracking of vitals that signals EC to your mobile phone. Some of those parameters are core body temperature, humidity, body position, skin temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, but also your activities. We are also in the process of partnering with a US company called Volt Yarns by the Supreme Corporation Group uh, to take this one step further. And Volt Yarn described themselves here as, uh, let's make yarns and fabrics the uh, the very best way we possibly can, using everything available to us in the world and base it on physics and chemistry. Volt yarns are currently working with NASA sensors, GPS-enabled clothes, gear and fabrics, wireless charging, and heated fabrics and clothes. And here you can see some of the companies that they are working with on the federal government side in the US. So now over to our competitors. As uh, Transforming Textiles are the first one to ever create a five fiber yarn in history, our competition is rather complex. 
Competing patent and patented yarns does not have chemical free production, nor does it have innovative and novel combination of fibers. And a little bit about our business model. Well, it consists of us selling yarns and selling fabrics, garment sales, design and product development consultancy, IP and data, and licensing. Uh, we have been very fortunate to be featured globally in the press lately, and amongst other top tier publications such as Forbes, Business Insider, and you may visit our website to read some more about it. Uh, they are all listed uh, listed there for you to see. So it's transformingtextiles.com. You can also go to sensetext.com to deep dive into the technology. Or if you're interested in the fashion brand, you may go to modality.store. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you've enjoyed this presentation today. And <laughs> you've got some takes away from it. Um, we look forward to seeing you in September for the Milan Fashion Week uh, runway show where we will present our new Sensetex fashion collection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's been, been great having you directly from Sweden and uh, uh, thank you for your fascinating presentation. I was talking about the scientific approach, and here really we are talking about science, uh, really uh, innovative production, uh, a bit uh, complicated maybe to, to catch up, to uh, fully understand and grab, uh, but uh, I'm sure that uh, it will have uh, success uh, in the near future. Uh, because uh, that's where fashion also is going, at least a branch of it, uh, into these very high-tech uh, uh, clothes which uh, help for several purposes, not just for covering up yourself or looking smart. So, wonderful. Thank you so much. And now we have uh, um, a presentation which is more, uh, uh, let's say, down-to-earth, uh, I would say in a positive way, um, and uh, I welcome uh, Leonora Friskin, Director of Fanella Design and Pots. Hi. From uh, UK, right? Egypt. And Egypt, right? I saw some of your pictures also from the website and so on. Thank so, you. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, yeah, just recently arrived from Cairo. So while all these marvelous things have been presented to us today by Sara, by Paolo, we're much more at the front line. We work in manufacturing in Egypt and have done so for 38 years. We see all the, the waste. We see what it actually looks like. And we wanted to find a solution. We wanted to find an end-to-end -end, end -end solution that everybody can be involved in. That's not for the super rich or not for the super conscious, just for all of us. And we have uh, three sustainable projects that we work on in Egypt. The first one we, is, a, is an easy one. We support um, a women's initiative where when the palm trees are... Um, trimmed and grown. They take all the waste, they lay it out in the natural sun, they dry it, and they turn it into palm leaf bags. So in the, that regard, we support them by selling their products and uh, helping them to design. That's a really simple one. Uh, I don't have it. Oh, here. Keep up. The second project is about the billions and billions of tons of waste that textiles production produces. And unfortunately, we can't do anything about that because there doesn't seem to be a significant reduction in the amount of clothes that we want to buy. We're working with all the major global brands and we see year on year the increase in production. So we have now decided that it's time to do something about that waste. Um, This is a textile brick. This is the waste that is one pair of denim jeans. At the moment, it's only suitable for internal decoration. 
However, by compressing all the waste and packing it, adding a, a plant-based cellulose, we can harden it and make it waterproof. We can then produce very, very low cost sustainable housing. So instead of all of this stuff going into landfill, it can be a positive initiative. So this is our latest innovation. And this is about tackling the mountains and mountains of waste that we're generating. So our, our presentation won't be as space age and as innovative as Sarah's, but it's very practical solutions to the problems we have here right now. But the feature project today, uh, yeah, sure. Touch, yeah, yeah. Um, so just, just while you're all having a, a feel of that and seeing you'll see the care labels and all the bits of buttons and things because it's a, it, the, the, the great thing about this is the waste doesn't need to be sorted. It can be compressed. We're, we're actually producing 92 million tons of waste in the textile industry and we're the second biggest polluter after oil. And for me, having spent all my life in textiles, I felt I just had to do something. I have to do something. And being at the front line was an opportunity to see how we could solve these problems and how we could solve them simply and sustainably. So this project is our latest innovation on the bricks. We're inspired by an artisan in Paris who's using it for interior design. But we can roll this out and provide low cost housing. So, but the featured project today, so our third project, which we we'll have been working on in Egypt for the last three years, is um, transforming and eradicating the need for plastic plant pots. Why do we use plastic plant pots? In 450 years' time, according to Imperial College London, they will still be leaching out toxins, but they won't have they won't have changed in any manner of any shape at all. So I wanted to have a look at the opportunity of taking a, taking a problem and fixing it right through to the end. And we came up with Planet Pots. So just a little bit about our, our, um, our journey with this. You see here the plastic pots. Everybody's got a shed of shame or a, they don't know what to do with it. The hidden cost of plastic pots is, is beyond measure, actually. So we looked into history and found that after farmers sheared their sheep, they used to take all the waste and protect their plants in cold weather countries. And from that, the idea was born. Um, we, we want to avoid this. I don't want to leave this for the future generations and nothing will change, it will just be buried. It won't biodegrade in any way. So we looked at farming as a start, and we decided that the farmers can't sell their wool. They have to shear their sheep every year, but they can't sell their wool because people are happy with acrylic and wool isn't as valued as it was previously. So because they can't sell the wool for a, a reasonable cost, they're burning it, increasing carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And that to me was just so wrong. So we decided to start with making a woolen plant pot. The benefit for the wool, for, for wool is this is really simple. One man with a window box can be the change. A government with a, a vast agriculture can be the change. We can all be the change. And um, the UK farmers can expect to get 10 to 30p, it's like 40 euro cents per kilo for their wool. It's got a much bigger value as you'll see as we go through the presentation. When you have a plastic plant pot, the plant is, has to grow the way that the plastic restricts it. So this, this is what happens to the root system. And that is a very unhealthy situation for the plant. When you plant that into the ground, 
the roots have shock because they're not constricted anymore and they don't allow the plant to be the best plant it can be to achieve its maximum potential. Um, so as you can see here, this is the ultimate sustainable fabric. Sheep, sorry, go back. <laughs> yeah, so this retains water. So for where there is water scarcity, and let's face it, that's an increasing part of the planet now, this retains 30% more water than a plastic pot. So you've all had that experience. You've gone to water your plant, and within seconds, the water's coming right through. Wool expands and holds the water and helps to hydrate the plant. Um, sorry, go back. I haven't finished on that one. <laughs> Maybe I'm too slow. Um, but it also has inherent um, insulation properties. So in warm climates, wool will keep the, your plant cool at its optimum temperature in warm climate in cold climate it will insulate it and it is 100% renewable 100% biodegradable and 100% natural so <clears throat> each plant each seed will develop into a unique plant a bit like all of us and this allows the roots to expand to be to create their own shape and maximize the plant's potential. The wool is naturally elastic, so you don't need several uh, sizes of pot. One little pot can grow a tree. Um, <clears throat> as I said, it hydrates the plant. It also enriches the soil and improves the biodiversity from the nitrates and the other natural properties that are within the wool. And if we have a look, sheep eats grass, gets sh sheared. We knit it into a pot. The pot produces the plant and nourishes that plant, being circular, completely circular. Um, up to date, the, we have sold now 2 million wool pots, but actually we need to sell, sell 2 billion. We need everybody, we need schools, we need people to start thinking differently about how they plant, um, use plants. So it's really, really user-friendly. You pop your, your plant in here with its soil and then you plant the whole thing. Depending on the soil type, within three to six weeks, this will have disappeared. While it's been biodegrading, it's actually repelling, it's actually repelling um, subsoil microbes and pests. It naturally rolls on the top and that stays on top of the soil. That naturally also repoils topsoil slugs and pests. So this is maximizing the potential to, to create, let the plant be the best plant it can be. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the, the whole presentation is based on the fact that we've got no waste. We're taking every scrap of the wool, we're washing it, and we're drying it in the sun. We're then um, spinning it and knitting it. So there is absolutely no chemicals, no, nothing dangerous, and nothing unnatural in the whole production cycle. So this is uh, basically a pot that's ready to plant. And you can see here where the, the roots have been able to do their own thing and grow into the shape they need. Um, thank you very much for listening to this. And we do hope that if you've got any questions or answers or you want to have a look at one in closer detail, you'll join us. Uh, downstairs at the cocktail party afterwards. Thank you for the invitation, Paula. Thank you, Leonora. And uh, before you leave, maybe I would like to understand, uh, uh, is your project uh, being carried out in uh, Egypt or in the UK? In Egypt, it's all carried out in Egypt. And uh, But you had um, people uh, purchasing this from all over the world. It's, uh, it's also online.
the government of Saudi Arabia at the moment in order to do um, a, as a contribution towards their zero uh, 2030 initiative in terms of um, palm, palm tree planting. That's great, great initiative and I hope somebody will be also interested and uh, we can also further speak with uh, Leonora during the networking. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leonora. And the next uh, speaker is uh, Catherine from uh, Catherine Story, directly from uh, the US, from beautiful California, right? Hi, I'm Catherine Story. I have a boutique um, and I'm a designer from Laguna Beach, California. Um, I've been designing for... I've had my brand for over 25 years, um, upcycling clothing from the beginning, which at the time, 25 years ago, we didn't know anything that we were doing any good for the environment. But I, for me, I just felt that there were so many great things that were discarded that could be turned into something wearable. And so that was the beginning of my career. And um, I used to just go to thrift stores, and be like rock t-shirts like this and turning them into something else. And it's evolved over the years um, going to rag houses where basically there are large bales of clothing and fabrics that you go through and find the best textiles and vintage laces and into my ethical couture collection, which is this is made from discarded beaded items where maybe parts of them um, are ruined, so they weren't. They had no monetary value, and so we take the good parts and we reattach, hand sew them back together um, to turn them into a new garment, and therefore the name "Loved Back to Life" because these were garments that somebody loved. Like even if you think about the vintage lace, we used to hand, we used to hand those down. They were like heirlooms, and um, now they're like discarded in the corner of the vintage store, you know, so it's been really wonderful learning about all the different different techniques that are, are really a dying art. Um, even this hand beading, they do it now, but it, you know, it's, it takes a lot of manpower and a lot of hours where this piece is just as beautiful as if it was made um, brand new today. So I've been blessed enough to really do this as an artist. And um, this is really uh, has been my passion. And I have um, another atelier in Miami, and I sell all over the, the country um, wholesale. And um, this is, I'm, I'm the, I call myself the OG of uh, upcycling because um, I'm like the original gangster of uh, <laughs> upcycling. Even, I didn't know what I was doing, but I'm really grateful I fell into it. And, and now I'm passionate about it. And it's been so wonderful to be involved and be certified here because I've been able to um, really share it with my clients. And it, you wouldn't think that California uh, wasn't as aware, but we aren't as aware as, as, as they are here, as you are here in, in Italy and in the, Europe, in the EU. It's fascinating to me that um, people don't know about sustainability and what really the fashion, it's not just, there's just not a, as much awareness. So it's been awesome for me to be able to share that with my clients and also expand my YouTube channel by giving instructionals like I show how to do this, you know, if you wanted to do this yourself and, and also having interviews with um, other people to talk about it. So been very grateful and thank you so much for inviting me to come. And um, yeah, this is it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, you mentioned the two horrible places, Miami and California. Yeah. Where, where are you actually based? In California? I'm based in California. I, all my work is out of California. And then I also have part.
part of my collection in Miami. So. Yeah. Okay, so if anybody is touring around Miami, yeah. there is a place yes. where they can yes. visit. I'm in the Faena Bazaar there, which is a beautiful boutique. Yeah. Great. So, of course, we uh, you will you'll be able to obtain all this information from uh, from us and later also during the networking. Uh, we have invited also several uh, boutiques, uh, apart from journalists and and so on. So, if there's any boutique who is uh, also interested in the brands that you see here you know feel free to be in touch with them thank you so much thank you. Catherine thank you. Thank you. so the next uh, speaker is uh, Esme Egerton from the brand Esme directly from UK hello Esme very nice to have you here Your, this, uh, yeah, your, this microphone works and uh, we'll wait for the model, right? Is there a model? Yeah, we've got a beautiful yeah, model. Wonderful. He's a lifeguard. So yeah. we can turn on the music? I think so. Okay. I mean, I hope he's ready. I don't know. Is he ready? <laughs> Well, it's the first time I've seen that look on all together, and I really like it, actually. So it's the first time I've seen this look on uh, Matteo, and I think it uh, looks amazing. Um, yeah, thanks for modelling it. Um, so I'll just explain. My name is Esme. I'm based in the UK. Um, I'm a fashion designer, and I'm also a fashion design lecturer at Central St. Martins in London. So part of my job, really, as well as being a designer and creating product, is to inspire the next generation. So uh, what I've got here actually is a look that's made completely from Egyptian cotton. So um, Leonora and I are friends from Egypt. So I met her there on a sourcing trip last year. And um, these are some pieces that I've been creating for the collection. So um, the trousers that Matteo's wearing, which are like a camo pyjama type trouser, they're made from 600 thread count cotton, Egyptian cotton. So if any of you have got beautiful Egyptian cotton sheets, they'll feel a little bit like that, very luxurious. We've also got, again, the vest that he's wearing. That's a slub cotton, got certified. So Paolo mentioned the certification system, uh, got certification, which means it's been created um, these were actually fabrics that were created using biodynamic farming in Egypt. Um, I won't talk too much about that because I'm not a specialist, but I think, you know, basically it means there's not a lot of harm to the environment. And it's a fully circular system where, you know, you have to have cows that create manure that feed the earth, which... So it's a fully circular system, but someone else would know a lot more about that than me. Uh, and then we've got the jacket, which is, again, Egyptian, got certified cotton. Um, this look is all about the beach. So it's brilliant that Matteo's uh, modelling because he spends a lot of time on the beach in Italy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we've got the bag. At the gym. Now, pardon? At the gym also. Yeah, well, both of those are great for the, this outfit. Uh, now, I'll mention a little bit about the bag, which was created by Leonora in Egypt. This is actually using uh, recycled cotton. That's right, isn't it? Organic and recycled cotton. So um, you'll notice there's a little bit of a difference in colour because it's the recycled cotton. So it's all Egyptian fabrics, basically. Um, yeah, is my presentation ready?
your presentation. Oh, yes, sure. Yeah, that just because I know I've only got 10 minutes. Yeah, click, uh, somebody stole. I'm right. Gosh. I'm not very the... techy. <laughs> Maybe it's me. Eh? I don't know. Oh, okay. Is there any of the speaker? Oh, it's over here. Oh, okay, it's over here. Right. Brilliant. There. Oh you have to God, push no. I'm this. I'm intimidated. Push. What, this just, one? Yeah, just to move on okay. to the next slide. That's Catherine. Yeah. Here we go. This is the brand Esme E, humanity and creativity. Um, I think the fashion industry has been very dehumanized. So, you know, I really want to go in deep and see exactly what's happening. So here we are. This is uh, my trip to Egypt last year. So um, you see I've got a few certifications up there. So we've got the cotton. For those of you who don't know what cotton looks like, it's a fluffy ball. And uh, this uh, image in the middle is on the streets of Egypt. So this cotton may have actually been some waste. Uh, they use it for other things there like... Um, mattresses stuffing mattresses and this is actually in the factory where i buy my fabric so um they're just outside cairo um so what's really important is to be fully traceable as a designer and share your story um right next image okay so this is where I buy my fabric from. So it's actually a place called Seachem. It's two outside hours outside of Cairo. And um, what was wonderful is that I could, do you know what? Someone's talking, it's really distracting me. Yeah, sorry. It's just, uh, you know, <laughs> we've only got 10 minutes. Okay, so this is on the farm in Egypt. And what was really wonderful is actually they've got 45% female employment there. And that, I think that's quite unusual, really, in that part of the world. And this is me eating with the girls at the Sea Chem factory. And what's wonderful is they have, like, you know, vegetarian food there in their canteen every day. So they're really into the rights of the employees and that they're being well treated. Uh, here we've got some images of the bag from Industry Waste. And uh, these are some images of what the raw industry waste looks like. And these are actually cotton seeds. Um, this is another um, organization that I'm a member of. It's called Women in Cotton. It's, again, an organization that empowers women in every part of the cotton chain. So that could be from logistics or design or manufacturing. Um, here again, now, um, these are some bags produced by Leonora again, and uh, from the palm tree waste that she mentioned to you that we're in our fashion show that we had with uh, the World Sustainable Organization in uh, September here in Milan, and we're having another show next September. Um, and I just want to show you the palm trees as well. So those bags there are a product of those trees. So it's all very local production. These are some images from the show. So what I like about this is that, you know, it's a tricultural collaboration. So, you know, I'm in the UK, we've got the Egyptian fabrics and we've got promotion um, that's happening here in Milan. And these are some other of the um, looks that were in that show, all using GOTS certified organic Egyptian cotton. This is a little bit about printing because printing is one of the massive pollutants in the fashion industry. Um, so I've been extra careful to research all the printing methods. So I went right back to art school methods, which is hand screen printing. And, and again, this is in Egypt. Um, you can see that they're printing by hand, and these were some of the labels that I got printed there. Um, now, I really like to work with different artisans. 
So as part of this collection, I also work with some craftspeople based in the UK who were of Turkish Cypriot origin, and they specialize in hand macrame techniques. So I think there's a real um, movement in fashion to go back to craft and, you know, really working with the craftsmen, craftspeople and finding out what their strengths are and uh, embedding them into collections. So, so two of the looks from the collection were in macrame, and we also produced some um, earrings and other accessories. Um, so these are some of the looks. Um, again, on the point of inclusivity, um, I really wanted to create garments which are good for everybody. So I want to produce a collection, you know, that sort of can be women's wear, men's wear, anybody wear, and not, you know, particularly age specific. So um, this is actually a photo shoot that I did with my mum. She was a model in the 1960s and uh, we shot this in Wales. So I was quite happy to produce things that could, you know, look good on um, a variety of ages. How are we doing for time, Paolo? Oh, that's good. Uh, again, some other looks from the collection. So this was the lookbook. Um, I mean, the collection is all about the ultimate summer holiday, you know, going away on a cruise in Greece and southern Italy and, you know, you go out for dinner wearing all white, looking pristine. Um, so this is a, this this was actually shot in England. and. Um, but that's the vibe that I wanted to put across in this collection. Now, part of my sustainable process is working digitally during the sampling process. So now one of the other problems that we've got in the fashion industry is design development and development of samples. So what normally happens is, you know, a designer's wherever, let's say in London, New York, the design sent to somebody in India or China, created, sent by DHL back, fitted, sent by DHL, you know, there's all these packets going across the world with DHL or UPS with samples and which is costing money, costing time and also, um, you know, the carbon footprint isn't very good. Now, the solution to that is working digitally um, in 3D to make your samples. So I work on um, with software called Clo 3 d and uh, I create the garments on avatars, and then I've got the actual correct pattern. So I can experiment and work on all those different iterations on my computer so I don't have to do all the packets, the DHLs going all around the world. So this saves a lot of time and also means I can be more experimental um, during the process. So this is like an avatar and uh, this is like a hoodie with fringes that I created on the avatar. And there you've got the digital pattern. Now, when I've made that pattern, I can then send it directly to a factory, wherever, China, India, Italy, as a DXF file, and they can make it for me exactly as it looks on the avatar. So it's um, saving everything, time, materials, and everything. Okay, next one. Here, oh, we have got... Um, yeah, we've got the items that Matteo's wearing, actually. So this was the, uh, the um, I like to call it a pyjama cargo. It's a bit like a pyjama with pockets. Uh, we've got that created digitally in 3D, and then you've got the real one. And then we've also got the vest. So this is a, a racer back vest with the pocket created digitally in 3D, and then we've got the real one. So, um, yeah. I mean, I teach this in a lot of universities, and uh, so the next generation of designers will use this. Okay, here we go from C to store. So these are some of the certifications. Uh, we've got Friends of the Earth, Egyptian Cotton, Women in Cotton. Well, they're not certifications, they're organizations, actually, that I'm a part of. 
uh, GOTS, the fabrics I use are GOTS certified. And um, this is another organization kind of certification in Egypt, Economy of Love, which you can do a little bit of research into. Again, they're looking after the welfare of employees and, you know, women's rights, that type of thing. So that's it from me today. Um, if you want to get in touch, there's my email address. I'm on Instagram and uh, you can also check out my website. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esme. It's been a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. And um, I know that uh, there might be some journalists here today. I know that uh, uh, the, um, the factory in Egypt, uh, the production in Egypt, uh, is in a very special place, right? Not too far away from uh, Cairo. Yeah. Very nice and uh, very interesting to to visit too. So we were thinking of organizing a, like a press tour. So if there's any journalist here today interested, mm -hmm. we'll uh, take care of it. Uh, we'll organize and uh, we'll come and visit uh, directly this this great work that you are carrying out together with this this uh, company there in Egypt. Yeah, I think it'd be a wonderful experience for anybody to visit Egypt anyway and to see what's happening there. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So here we have the next uh, brand is uh, Victor. Uh, everything all right? <laughs> Nobody got hurt? Tutto bene? Più o meno, more or less. Aspetta un attimo. Okay. So the next speaker and brand is Victor Hart, uh, directly from? From uh, Ghana in Bologna. Wow, Ghana in Bologna. <laughs> Great. So today we had, uh, we had with us uh, brands from the US. UK, Egypt, now Ghana. So really, we are we will have somebody also from uh, South America. So really, we are covering good part of the continent. Welcome, Victor. I am Victor, uh, regional Bob Abihat. I'm from Ghana and uh, I live in Bologna, Italy. Um, yeah, this is my brand called Victor Hat. Uh, it's my first name and the last name because I I had a brand back in Ghana, which was Gavachi. It's um, mostly pronounced in the wrong way. So after a decade of working in fashion, I decided to change everything because I need to restart and understand what I'm really about and what I really want to do. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> I am a sculptor by profession, which uh, I have worked as a sculptor for like uh, um, seven years, also working in fashion for uh, a decade. So. Yeah, I started working as I was schooling, and also after schooling, I taught in the university as well in Ghana. And uh, I decided to drop everything I'm doing in Ghana to travel because uh, I saw a bag in Ghana back in 2000s because my cousin came back from London and showed me like a Burberry bag, Gucci bag, and I was really fascinated. So that started the point that my curiosity started to grow. And then uh, after my university, they, I was asked to. Uh, do my master's so I said no I don't want to study in Ghana I want to travel and then luckily I had a scholarship in Milan so I came 2018 and then I started to study again in fashion and it really changed my mind because first of all Italy is a country that has the best quality of uh, manufacturing in the world repurpose my way of working and also understanding who I am and also bringing what I learned in sculpting into, into because in Ghana, 
I was doing and nobody understood what I was doing also. Even my parents were like, you should drop this because there's no future. But then after coming back and working with some brands in Bologna for like the three years, I decided to quit because there was, there was so much vision going on, which I wasn't much interested in. So I wanted to really pursue what I truly, truly want and what I really love because I like to build with my hands for sure. Because after working for 10 years, I don't know how to sit down and watch videos, tell people to do stuff. I prefer to work on it myself. After working on it, I then I give to people to just elaborate with it and play with it for me. So that's how I started all over again with Victor Hart. So I'm mostly focused on craftsmanship because uh, I believe that if you build a very good product or a very good dress, no matter how it is, uh, how much uh, tissue or how bad or how good is going to last long because uh, as a sculptor, we deal with shapes. Uh, we build based on, on shapes, based on forms, based on textures. And in learning all of these, I decided to bring them back into making a simple garment, which comes to talk about all of everything that I want to talk about. So an example is what I'm wearing, which is like a shirt and also like a jumper. So in this, I play with it a lot. Like uh, I wear with a um, turtleneck, I wear with a shirt, I wear with everything that I could have in my wardrobe without breaking the bank, because that's the most important part. And uh, um, in working in Bologna, I think uh, I discovered uh, upcycling because I was working with uh, a project in Bologna, which pushed me so much to try upcycling I, because I was really pissed off with it because uh, in Ghana, we are not much interested in uh, reusing stuff. We like new stuff. We always want to go to Europe. We always want to see beautiful things, but... Uh, when they asked me to work on the projects about reparation, I was like, I don't think I could do it. Then I started to embark on a journey of finding vintage shops. And before before also, I worked in Milan as a cool hunter in Milan for like two years. We were creating testers for Calvin Klein, Prada, Gucci, um, Valentino, I think, and Dior. Because uh, I was an uh, intern, so I learned a lot in the testers and then... After learning all of this, I started to find things that are really interested for me. And uh, I found Hiera. I think it's the place they dump all the clothes, all the rubbish. So I go there every Wednesday fighting with old women <laughs> on uh, products like uh, jeans, jackets, uh, TV, anything you could find. So when I go there, I just tell them. I don't want anything. I just want jeans. They should just take me to where there's a jeans. So when I go, I start to search and pick them up. The ones that are really terrible, I take them back to the studio and start to rework on them. But the funny thing is after treating the, 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 the garment, I think of who is going to make it, who is going to wear it. I also think of do I really want it because I build the product based on what I like. It's not based on what a client, based on what people want, because I really don't care about that much. I think of what I wake up in the morning, what I want to wear. And I want to ask a question. Who here thinks a lot in the morning before dress? Yes, that's the problem. Um, I, I found that working in fashion that a lot of people have a lot of thinking when they wake up. And before I said, okay, I want to do Victor Hart. Where is the sector I want to interact with? I thought, I myself think that workwear is the best one because we spend nine to 10 hours at work. And when we have problems in terms of waking up in the morning, first thing you don't have a dress to wear, your day turns upside down. So in finding this uh, problem, I was like, okay, let me try with my friends. So I tried with a couple of my friends, a doctor, an architect, a commercialista, uh, a lot of people. And then they keep telling me the problems. I go to their houses, listen to them, and they, they just keep telling me all the problems. I'm like, okay. Then I try to find uh, things that they like and build upon and what I like. So I ask them, would you wear a trench? Would you wear a jacket? Would you wear a shirt? They were like, I don't know. And these people are not fashion people. They are just average people. So they help me to understand a lot. And uh, in everything that I create in Bologna, it's based on what they give to me and the feedback and the complaints and the problem and the crying. 
and that's what I put into uh, tests, finding things to relate to what they like, finding things to what they hate, and then putting them together. So in finding all of these problems and understanding sustainable fashion my own way is about finding the purpose of how I wake up early in the morning that I know that I have one jacket, I have six pants, I have three shirts. How can I use it? I just switch them up every day. People see me, ah, you look very beautiful. This is like a jeans I find in here like two years ago. I keep wearing them. These ones are the recycling I did. This one is I bought in the vintage shop for like two euro. So in searching for all of this, I try to tell the story myself. I don't want to tell a lie. So I, I test myself. I'm a very disciplined man. So I try to push myself to the wall to just do it and see how it's going to work before I can recommend someone so uh, also with my brand i don't force people to buy even if you don't like it i'm okay because i prefer you buy something you want rather than convincing you to buy and throw away and it takes a lot of time for me to build to also come up with the concept come up with the ideas and playing with it in the studio it's been two years working without salary without understanding that i have to sell something with anyone but constant building and finally i decided to just test it out in milan and see how it's going to work and the feedback is really amazing for me so <clears throat> so uh these are my most important things that i deal with sustainability first of all who you are knowing your body knowing yourself and understanding what you have to put on your body because what you put on your body is what represents your personality and what represents who you are as a person in society. And uh, in building all of this also, the upcycling situation that I have seen in Italy is, is really terrible because in Ghana, I, in my family, I am from a family of bakers. My grandma, my mom, my aunties, they are all bakers. They just uh, give the dress to my sister, my cousin, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. And when I started my first brand in Ghana, my grandma went back to his, her wardrobe, gave me a tissue which has lasted over 70 years. And I, I started to use it back in university and I didn't understand. But after understanding all of this, living with them, understanding the importance of giving the dress for my sister, for my mom, for my cousins, for my uncles, then I said to myself, this is how we were dealing with sustainability in Ghana without even knowing the knowledge about it. But here in Europe, there's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of articles, journals. There's a lot of professors. There's a lot of big, big investment about sustainability. But yet, when I go to Hera, I cry because people don't care about what they put on their body. People don't care about what they interact with. They just do it because they want to follow a trend, because they want to just impress people. And this is what I desist from it. So understanding this, I created the awareness by telling people that really want my garment. Do you want it? What do you want? What do you need in your wardrobe? Tell me one good thing you want to put in your wardrobe that you can wear every day. It could not be my brand. I'm okay. You can find other brand, it's better because you mix and match other people's stuff together, create the personality that you want. And now we live in the technology world, so everybody's much more focusing on, I want to be Instagram, million likes, million votes. It doesn't really make sense to me, excuse my language, because for me, it's more, most about what you do to affect society to improve. And that's how sustainability for me it should be. If we always talk about uh doing a lot doing this doing this and then we come back again and then we just put it back again what's the purpose but if we know exactly what we want and we know exactly who we are i think there's so much we can we can just keep away and understand that this is the way we can do it if the government puts some funds if a private uh, institution gives some incentives to improve the, the the research they are doing i think it could help a lot because at the end of the day people understand what they are about people understand what they need so there is a lot of this uh, uh necessity that we have to understand before we even engage with it so uh building up cycling the uh, collection was more fun for me because i started building on things like this in bologna with a um, artisan or craftsman after the COVID, there was a uh, 1 million craftsmanship people uh, closed because there was no job. So in Bologna, I decided to search. And then I found um, 
a family of two, a mom and a daughter who has been working for like 60 years. And they are really difficult to deal with, but I like them so much because in starting on making a product, I go to them, we discuss. They tell me it's not possible. Okay, we try. They tell me this is not good for you. Okay, we try. That's my keyword. We try. After we try, you can complain. I'm okay with it. So when I started to build with them, we do the patterns. I set the jeans. We build in the studio. And then I go back to find the tissue, the um the jeans from here, which is really good. I have to wash, I have to treat. Some of them also, they are so weak that you have to reinforce them again. So I have to put wax textile, which is from Africa, because I know for a fact in Ghana, we have one of the most traditional uh, printing in, in the world. It's part of the country that has the traditional printing. So, and Ivory Coast also. So I like to go to the markets on Sundays with my mom and try to learn about the patterns, try to learn about the colors and why we need it in our houses, in our wardrobes and why we wear it on funerals, on celebrations, on parties and all of that. So after understanding for a fact that I'm from Ghana, I cannot throw away where I'm from. I have to keep it intact. I have to find something I can connect back with. So most of the, 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 the collection that I build, I have to I use colorful uh, textiles from Ghana and Ivory Coast to put inside to merge to keep it more strong. So that when you wear, when you have movement in the in the dress, it can still uh, stand with the, the shock because cotton is really good from Africa. And also the jeans has been worked so much and some of the jeans too are really good. So when I found them, they are a bit new. It gives me the opportunity to, to really reinforce it really well. So this is like two years of uh, research I did and I keep wearing it. I keep washing. I keep trying to dry clean. I try to find new ways to uh, preserve it. And then when I go to the laundry, they keep telling me the ideas. You have to do this. You have to put it here. You have to keep it dry. And it's a long process that I understand that sustainability is not just about one or two fabrics, also about how you preserve it. Through the process of you want to keep it fresh every, every winter, every summer, because in Ghana we have just two seasons, the dry and then the rainy season. And we buy raincoats only in the rainy season, in the dry, in the dry season. We wear tank tops, t-shirts is a lot we wear. And then most of the jeans that we wear. So understanding this how i keep my jeans back in ghana is when we wear it i remember when we were kids we used to keep our dress in the fridge that was what my cousin told us so after i learned a lot about that i changed and now here i go to the laundry to learn about the drying services to learn about the preservation services and there's so much that there are so great people working in such places that they want to just teach people they want to tell people that you should do this to keep your dress long i never knew how to keep wool because i have not used wool in my life until i came to italy so if i have a wool i go to them how i treat this jacket how i treat this pen how i choose this shirt and then they tell me the research about it you know this is from this country you have to uh, uh, keep it in this way you have to keep in a certain temperatures it's a it's really long for consumer to learn but i think we can start from some way we start with what we like we buy less we, we find what we like and we keep it for a long time so we can use it for so much and we pass it on to our uh, the next generation. And also the market trends that I have learned. Okay. The, the market trends that we I have seen so uh, recently is, is really terrible in my opinion because every time there is a new brand, every time there is a new article coming out. Now there is Sheen, there is Temu, there is Boho, there is Lulumon. All these brands are pushing fast fashion to everyone. But how can we tackle this as, as a consumer? Also trying to fight against the trends. That's why I believe that we should always try to find a sustainable independent brand because the more you support them with one or two purchases, it keeps them going to support their team and also to research more and also to bring you new ideas so they can move forward. And uh, uh, the vision that I, I have uh, crafted in all this process is mostly to be transparent about my what I do. Uh, this is what I, uh, I do, and I am telling you exactly what I do in the studio and what I'm wearing also is not a fallacy. When I met Mr. Paolo and Annabelle, they were, they were telling me this is really good because we have seen a lot of upcycling, but this is a different level of upcycling. Why? Because 
I kept true to myself, the artist that I am, the vision that I have that I want to change how people dress in the next five, in the next 10 years is what I want to push. And I know it's a long game, so it's not really short that I have to do everything. And the craftsmanship comes with the forms. Because I'm a sculptor, I start with shape, how we can function in shape. So like this box jacket that I'm wearing, there's a shoe shoulder pad in the shoulders which keeps it more strong and firm and keep your silhouette intact so you can play with dresses that i, I make you can play with the waist from the uh, the waist to the down but the top i always try to keep it sharp simple clean and precise so when you wear it can transform you into a different level of seeing your body in a different ways not always in the o in the a in the h but give you a different type of silhouette that you think is really difficult to wear but it's, it's very interesting when you put it on your body you can fall in love with it and then you can purchase something from me and uh, <laughs> the design process also i source the local places because i think finding local places to source is the most interesting thing that you find a lot of ideas you find new testers you find new materials and in doing this in bologna alone has taught me a lot and also trying to understand the big brands the the leftover tissues that they want to just discard I go to uh, certain markets and try to find the people who are selling this uh, to this brand and I ask them, can I buy them on a, on a cheaper price? And then they give me a deal. Sometimes they give me a deal, sometimes no. And hopefully I am able to get some quantity of denim, which I bought really on a different part of the market that I'm presenting my collection tomorrow at Via de Mercante Due uh, on the calendar. So this is a new collection I built from, ups, uh, apart from the upcycling, I did the research with the new denim from the waste materials to build this one to be elegant. Because in Italy, there are a lot of elegant people. They know the tailoring, they know the taste. When I see someone like Mr. Paolo dress in the suits, I understand because in working with Italians, they teach me what it's meant for them to be important to have a suit, to have a pant, to have a socks with the shoes. And for me, I'm young, so I just play with it. They tell me, ah, oh, you cannot wear uh, Crocs with your jacket. Who cares? How I feel is the most important part. So if I'm happy, I don't care about most of what people are saying. But if it looks also sensible to them and it's elegant and it's also fresh, they like to tell me, I want to try something with you. And then we try to have a conversation and try to discover themselves through the process. And yeah, this is my process. So this is my prof who is in Milan, that I stress him a lot to teach me how to do a lot of tailoring. And then uh, this is the studio that I go in Bologna and I always try to find average normal people on the street, talk to them about, hey, I'm building a collection, I want you to try. Because when there's an idea of a fashion model who is on diet, it doesn't make sense to me. Average normal person who is normally eating all the food she wants to eat or he wants to eat, I take them to the studio, we try, I give to them to wear it for a couple of months, weeks. And then I decided to rework on the shapes to understand how people grow through the dress also. So in creating the shape, the, the sizes, for my dress, the sizes come from the shoulders. If I'm able to capture your shoulders, the rest of the body is easy for me because I understand the anatomy of a human being. So that's more easy for me. And then uh, the communication and the storytelling is much important for me also because if I build something good, something nice, and I want to collaborate with people and I cannot tell a good story, it doesn't make sense to the market that there is something new, there is something fresh. I want people to understand that I see fashion in a different point of view, in a different way that they can understand, not now, but tomorrow or the next five years or the next 10 years. And uh, yes, uh, this is my customer profile that I have that I'm working towards to achieve with other people that are really interested because it's a workwear brand. I want to just dress people in a better way so they can go to work, they can function very well. A little story is I, I went to a bank to open a bank account. They said no because I was dressed in a hoodie as a black in Bologna and nobody believes the story until I took an Italian to the bank and then they spoke to them, they opened the account for me and then again, I was dressed elegant in another day, they gave me a cappuccino. So that also gave me another thought of point of view on how Italians see how you dress, because it says a lot to them. It's not about some people are uh, racist, they are ignorant and they don't know a lot. So in understanding who you are and also interacting with you, they begin to open up. In Bologna, I dress like this every day and people ask me, 
How are you? Where are you from? If I put on a hoodie, I can walk in the city for 10 years. Nobody will ask me my name. So this is how I approach people also in Bologna. And uh, this is an example of also the upcycle and the Djibouti that I made um, and the collaborations. I think uh, now I'm opening up to collaborations, but I have a specific type of collaboration. I need to understand the vision of that person. If it's very quick, I'm not interested. If it's a long-term uh, collaboration that we can understand and play along to reach out to a certain goal, to change something a little bit, that's the way forward for me. So there are some uh, celebrities I work with in Milan. I I made the dress for them. I asked them, don't post me because I'm not in line with your vision, but I will just want to dress you based on the commissions they gave me. And also some brands that I did collaboration with in Bologna, in Textile, the Wax Texas. I go to Africa, we find them, we come then, we make them into something simple and nice so people can wear. And uh, yes, I want to found Sonia Suzani to present the collection I'm working on to test the market to see if it's really working. And the feedback was really amazing. I was surprised how people were really able to interact with it. These are, this is a, a client I met on the, on the platform and they were really trying all the dresses. I was just watching them try it. I video, I take the comments and then when I go back to the studio, I rework on the comment that they give to me. And then the market size is really big. By 2027, it's going to be $63 billion. So I think there's so much opportunities in the market that we can really achieve anything that we want to achieve. It doesn't matter if you want to follow a trend or you want to stick to your point of view. Because when you have a point of view, at the point the market will catch up with you. But if you follow the trend, you keep following and you will never finish. And then you run out of funds also. So uh, this is my new collection dropping tomorrow. And I have some videos of the processes that I work with the pattern makers in Bologna on my website. And tomorrow, if you are around, you can catch me at the Via di Mercato Due. And then you can see the whole collection that I'm presenting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Thank you so much. Really fascinating story yours, and I'm sure you'll uh, you'll have plenty of uh, success. You're already being successful. I think you gave us uh, I think you gave us a lot of food for thought uh, when he told the when he described uh, how in Ghana people pass from generation to generation, which is which is what actually used to happen also in Italy. It still happens somehow, but uh, uh, it is true that we are losing that. You know, there's like, uh, we're feeling ashamed of, uh, of doing this because oh, maybe it's not good, etc. cetera. But uh, that's really the first step for sustainability to avoid throwing away, to give it to somebody who might need and so on. So uh, is Victor your real name, Victor yes. Hart? It's, well, it Victor looks like... Uh, British and Ghanaian. Uh, my my father's father is from British, and my father is from Ghana. So I took all the family name. <laughs> but it sounds very very stylish, right, Victor Hart? That's very good. All the best. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you so much, Victor. And the next speaker is. Uh, Elisabetta Perer. Hello, Elisabetta. Nice to have you here. It's time from Italy, yes, finally. I'm Italian, but I'm trying to speak in English for you. I actually lived in England for 10 years. And, and we, will, we will wait for the model to come in. We are waiting. Okay. Ah, yes, it's better like that. So, um, the model is wearing actually what I wear when I teach yoga because I'm a yoga teacher, and uh, so that's where it started from many years ago. I was looking for materials to wear something really breathable, comfortable, but really uh, European style. Because when I was doing yoga many, many years ago, 
uh, people were wearing just uh, canapa, uh, linen, white, big things, which obviously beautiful in India, but I said, I'm a European, I don't feel a guru. <laughs> I just feel a yoga teacher and I want to teach this discipline for people making, feeling well, but I'm also a designer. So <laughs> that's my problem. I like a bit of style in what I'm wearing. And the new idea for me was, but when I started, it wasn't really understandable because I was really... Who are you? You are not sportive, you are not elegant, what are you? What is this clothes? So my idea was that when I come from out from a, from a lesson, wherever I am, and I may be busy to go somewhere else, I just change my shoes and I carry on my life. And this is why it's an hybrid idea. So uh, then, obviously, this is the part of style, but then... Uh, um, what I was worried is what you wear. If you, because I'm a yoga teacher, I also like to eat well, uh, have respect for the earth, for the sea, for the people, how I talk to people, how um, people talk to me, because stress is the main problem in the world. People get ill, people get illness. Um, they bring inside their um, negativity and then they start to really have a headache. Uh, whatever, you know, everybody's got something in pain. But in reality, if you live with a good food, organic food, healthy environment, uh, you really enjoy just a really also um, a moment for yourself. Just stop for a second and relax and have a good breathe in and breathe out, as I say, maybe slowly. And then you start to feel that everything works inside you. And if it's, this is good, then have to be also what you're wearing. I can't wear something when I touch it. I feel really, it's incredible when you start to be really sensible, you start to feel really what is behind these clothes. And if there is a pain behind, if there are people suffering because they made these clothes in an environment very bad where they suffer, they don't have much money to eat, the children are in a bad condition, I feel it. And this is not right. So the searching was for the good material. <laughs> so the good material for me to start in was micromodal. And when I find this micromodal, I thought, wow, this is fantastic. So soft, it gives you freedom. So when I'm wearing, doing yoga, and I move, my body doesn't feel the clothes on. It's like you've been naked. So you're free on movement. The micromodal can be uh, sustainable or not. So there are two types. So we have to be careful when you say, oh, it's micromodal, so good, it's sustainable, let's buy it. Instead, there are micromodal made, obviously it's made from wood. So if they disforest uh, the, 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 the trees from uh, Brazil, uh, whatever, uh, if the tree are just cut off to make this uh, material and then we are without oxygen so i found this firm this from austria they they actually uh, have a, an, an area where they have this beech tree fajo tree where they constantly have a new tree coming on and the fajo tree the beech tree is very quick to grow so very quickly you can have a tree so you replace the tree and it's fine another thing is not using a lot of water for what you make so the big problem in fashion system is they use an incredible amount of water so uh, again this firm managed to use uh, 50 percent off of the water so and the fiber of this modal micro modal is very strong so you can again wash it for millions of years, let's say, for your, all your life, you can have it, maybe you get off because you don't like it anymore, but is uh, resistant to water, to chemical, and also doesn't catch the chemical. So if you use, for example, if you're not caring about the product you use for your washing, then this, this material doesn't absorb it. So you don't have it in your skin because we have to be careful. Sometimes people have reaction in the skin. They don't know where it come from. And maybe it's when you, what you eat or maybe it's when, uh, when you wear something really with chemical inside. It goes in your skin. So we have to be really careful. I'm really sorry that people don't know yet and they buy anything without thinking. I'm wearing this. I'm not comfortable. Who can't wait to arrive home and take it off, for example. So for me that I'm a really a fashion lover, I it's obviously I need to buy things and feel comfortable and wear different things, but have to be that way. So the cotton also, it's uh, organic cotton. The same firm actually made the cotton in Costa d'Avorio. 
And in this place, uh, uh, they use the seed, which is natural, because cotton can be different. And if you use a seed with a lot of chemical in, when the plant come out, the plant is uh, um, it's not very strong. So they need to put a lot of water and put chemical on to make it resistant to to the environment to, 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 to be strong. So instead they use a real animal, they, go, they put them with a parasite and they work together so they don't need chemical on these plants. So the, uh, there was a girl that was showing her the plant of cotton, really big, fluffy things, beautiful. And what they do in this place, they also pick it up with the hands. So people are working and pick it up with the hands, not with machine, and it's no waste. So this is incredible. This is uh, really uh, helping a lot the sustainability. Uh, so this is the part that the, the model is wearing. So how I dress for yoga, also, obviously different color, but today I want to be minimalistic and she can wear it actually is incredible with high heels and it doesn't look really wrong. So for me, it's really good fun that I'm wearing also my clothes. Uh, so this is like a sweatshirt, a bit more feminine because I made this cut. So I don't want to feel I love actually English fashion when we are talking about England because I go often to London and I love all these big buggy things. But I have to obviously have my vision of what I, uh, what my brand uh, is the style and the style is minimalistic, simple, a bit of Italian way. So refined, but the material again, very suitable. So this, this is actually made with viscosa and acrylico and somebody say, Wow, viscosa and acrylic, why? So viscosa is actually was used from Stella McCartney. She actually searched in Sweden. There was a place where they, they actually uh, have the trees again, again, the same faggio that make viscosa because it's made from, uh, from a tree, which we actually don't know. And um, acrylic is another sustainable if <laughs> we are carrying you know, or where it come from. This acrylic come from a, a firm where they uh, replace plastic because it's made from plastic. So they replace the plastic. So it's a, a constant uh, using the same thing. So um, I'm also carrying that is made in Italy, it's made in Veneto, where I come from, but I live in Milan now, but it's, all the firms are in Veneto, uh, near Venice, near the Dolomites, where I come from. And um, the firm are very keen on the people, how they work in. And there are photovoltaic um, system for the electric. They use, for example, plastic for how they they put all the material on the side of wood, so they don't use too much wood, but they use recycled plastic. So it's all going on also with the people, how they feel, how they work. The environment is very important. So, so I try to look through everything for my, for my brand to be really going through better and better to be sustainable. So there we are. This is Perer is my surname. I didn't know what name put on and uh, people said to me, but you're talking about yourself, you're talking about respect and love and freedom. So let's put the name. <laughs> so there we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elisabetta. <laughs> and it actually sounds very good, Perer. It's really <laughs> Thank good. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you. And, Thank you so uh, much. You said uh, you don't do yoga anymore? You no, that? I do yoga. I do, actually. I couldn't be without. Actually, everybody should do yoga, for my opinion. We will be, everybody will be so more calm. Do you have a, like, a suggested position for everybody to relax after the... Maybe I can <laughs> say together, if we want, we can have a... Close your eyes for just one second. Think about how you breathe and just breathe in for a second. Breathe in. Hold on. In that moment that you hold, your mind doesn't, doesn't work and breathe out anything bad you have in your thoughts and breathe out. There we are. <laughs> oh, wow, I'm much more relaxed now, <laughs> yeah. We can go to the cocktail. Oh, no, sorry, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was great having you. And by the way, Modal in the, the material, the fabric that uh, Elizabeth is using quite a lot in its uh, products, in the um, index that I was showing was scoring very, very good. I noticed it today. It's a it's a very good uh, material, and in particular the the factory that is providing you in Austria is a very very serious one uh, with um, uh, all the um, uh, features and characteristics uh, for uh, being sustainable in the way that it produces, very well regulated. So the next uh, speaker is uh, was supposed to be Claudia Aureli of uh, Trame di Stile, but we have somebody 
Paula Gallo, who will uh, uh, speak on her behalf, and there's going to be a video. Welcome, Paula, for Trame di Stile. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Eh, sì. Buon pomeriggio, sono Gallo Paola, eh, rappresento e collaboro con eh, il marchio Trame di Stile, una collezione unica che nasce dalla creatività della dottoressa Claudia Aureli, da sempre impegnata in progetti che mirano a dare un contributo significativo nell'ambito della sostenibilità. Vi lascio con un estratto della sua intervista che poi troverete in versione integrale sui nostri canali social. Grazie a tutti. La visione di Trami di Stile è sensibilizzare il cliente nella scelta degli stili di vita che hanno un impatto importante sulla salvaguardia ambientale e sul benessere personale. La missione di Trami di Stile è creare capi artigianali di sartoria italiana con tessuti di origine vegetale che durino nel tempo. L'affermazione di una cultura e di uno stile si definisce attraverso la promozione del benessere e di strumenti in grado di migliorare la qualità della vita. Questo è tratto dallo stile italiano di Romano Benini. Storia, economia e cultura del Made in Italy. Trama di stile è sostenibile. In primis perché utilizza materiali di origine vegetale prodotti in rispetto dell'ambiente e col fine della conservazione delle risorse naturali. La collezione Trame di Stile, con la sua caratteristica di durabilità nel tempo e per l'utilizzo di materiali di alta qualità, risponde al modello dell'economia circolare. Infatti i capi a fine vita sono riutilizzabili o riciclabili completamente. Vi ringrazio a tutti, poi saremo lieti di darvi maggiori informazioni appunto su, sui nostri canali social. Grazie, buon pomeriggio a tutti. Molte grazie Paola, eh, ringrazio anche Claudia Aureli che ci sarà sicuramente ascoltando in streaming o comunque vedrà la presentazione. Eh, non è potuta venire ma sarà sicuramente per un'altra un occasione eh, molto interessante anche questa, eh, questo design questa designer, questo brand eh, avrete, avete tutti i contatti nella, eh, nel programma che potete scaricare eh, fotografando il QR code che avete trovato di sotto, immagino qualcuno di voi l'abbia già fatto ed era anche nell'invito e quindi troverete informazioni anche relativamente a questo brand. Ehm, 
prima di introdurre il prossimo speaker, eh, mi hanno detto di attendere pochi minuti perché si sta preparando l'altra modella, è una, uno speaker, una coppia, credo che ci siano entrambi, da, dal Perù, ma vivono in Italia, in verità una di loro non è peruviana, è italiana, il, il brand è un, un brand che produce eh, prodotti con alpaca, eh, questo animale proprio endemico del, del Perù, delle Ande, e, quindi un'altra presentazione interessantissima. Io credo che intanto possiamo dire che le, eh, ho trovato nella loro diversità le, le varie presentazioni estremamente interessanti, hanno portato ognuno qualche eh, valore mh, anche originale eh, che mh, ci può fare riflettere e che dimostra anche come la sostenibilità è una, qualcosa che si può esprimere in varie forme anche eh, e come dicevo prima utilizzando varie fibre perché abbiamo un po' visto tutte fibre diverse e anche con questa diciamo, relativa novità dell'upcycling del, o del riciclo della rigenerazione. Mi dicono che è tutto pronto, allora intanto invito i due speakers a venire a parlare. Donatella Carbone e Roberto Toro di Lux Alpaca. Facciamo un bel applauso così. Bene, ciao, benvenuti, benvenuti. Allora... Okay, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, Paolo. Uh, we are Lux Alpaca, as Paolo said before. Uh, I am Roberto Toro, and she is Donatella Carbone, and we created uh, this uh, startup, and we will get into details now. Uh, I guess this is not... <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Like this. Perfect. And there is not. Okay, here now. Oh, okay, see, so this is a table of contents. We will see who we are, our mission and vision, our inspiration, and why we chose uh, Alpaca uh, as a first material for, for our uh, startup. And we will see also our uh, targets, products, and milestones uh, to, to show you now. Okay, so Lux Alpaca was born two years ago during a travel in Peru. Robert and I, we, um, we met here in Milan and uh, attending an MBA here in, um, uh, in Milan. So we had always an idea to have our own business. And the Wilux Alpaca, we were in this travel in Peru and we were in uh, discovering uh, the Andes area and uh, wonderful communities that live there. And they explained us and showed us how they, what they do, how they work this uh, wonderful fiber that is originating from this area. So what we thought was to merge our uh, culture and our uh, traditions, uh, uh, merging the Italian design with the, this um, very ancient um, textile tradition and uh, uh, fiber that are uh, originated from Peru to create a brand that sells some product. Um, and uh, another driver for us was uh, uh, the sustainability of, um, of, our, uh, of our product. So um, go ahead. <laughs> so our mission, uh, Lux Alpaca is a brand, um, a sustainable brand and um, a sustainable brand that produces in Peru, but it's designed in Italy, um, obviously with a, with a mindset of a slow fashion. Similar to our visibility, we, our uh, vision, uh, we, are, uh, we want to redefine the luxury with a sustainable approach. So that's why these are our main pillars for, uh, for making you discover our inspiration in our, uh, in our collection and the future one. 
So our uh, inspiration were the Peruvian textile culture. So this um, uh, the textile tradition that leverages uh, both the um, exclusive fibers like uh, alpaca, and then we integrated also the pima cotton with the also um, technique that they use from crochet to knitwear and so on. Um, as we said before, with the an Italian design and the sustainability, because everything. Uh, uh, in the end-to-end -end process, uh, from the um, animal, uh, this the alpaca, that is uh, one of the greenest animals in the world, to the um, production of the yarn and to handmade production, everything is uh, done in uh, um, respecting the rhythm of the nature and is very slow. So our uh, uh, is a kind of a um, slow approach to the fashion. Good. So uh, before going further, I would like to know, or I would like to ask you uh, to raise your hand if you have ever uh, heard about alpaca. Oh, that's a good, that's good. That's a lot, actually. Uh, here in Italy, it's not that well known. Mm -hmm. um, our intention is to defund uh, this, um, this very precious material. Um, and we chose alpaca because 80% uh, of the alpacas uh, are located in Peru. I come, I come from there, and then uh, they have fantastic uh, characteristics. One of them, and the one I like the most, is the thermal, the thermal characteristics, uh, because it has is isolated you from from the outside. I mean, if it's a, if, hot, if it's hot outside or or cold you will stay with your normal temperature. So maybe as a testimonial of that, maybe our model can tell you, tell us uh, if she's hot or not. Senti caldo, Freda? Come la senti? Si sente confortevole. A posto, quindi. <laughs> then it's a, it's a demonstration of, of what alpaca is about because now I, I feel very hot, but um, the alpaca has that characteristics. And another, uh, another important characteristic, and we also see it in the beachwear, is that the, the, the beachwear that is used in the model now is a natural, as a natural, has a natural oh. color. So um, alpaca has um, around nine, uh, nine nat pure colors and 20, um, 20 shades. Um, so this is uh, very important because it's not uh, required to be dyed. Uh, so chemicals uh, has not passed from our uh, process. And even if we want to color something, if you have the chance to see our, mo our, our collections, uh, when we decide to do some red color or a, or a blue one, like in the scarves, uh, you you will notice that we dye it with the, with the special plants or maybe some uh, color of the insects. So it's it's a very very natural process, uh, and this is a technique coming from from the as Natella said as, as Natella said uh, coming from the Inca Empire. So it's a millenarial culture. Another important two points are the high, are the high durability. Uh, if we want to compare with, uh, let's say, cashmere or another cotton, uh, yes, um, they can they can have a hole uh, between uh, one on another season. While the alpaca, no, uh, it's very durable uh, because of its technical composition. Um, finally, um, the hypoallergenic property is very interesting because the absence of lanoline um, can make the, the, the fiber very um, good for the people who has uh, dermatologic problems and, and it becomes a very fantastic fiber. So that's why we chose it. Um, and also, Last but not least, uh, it's important to say that also um, for our uh, summer collection, we chose uh, the Pima cotton that has uh, similar characteristics. Um, so that's why we cover the whole year uh, with, the, uh, with the fall and summer, uh, summer seasons. So what we produce, uh, the model now is wearing a uh, um, piece from our summer collection. It's made 100% in a baby alpaca, uh, natural color, as Roberto said, not dyed, and is uh, done in a crochet, handmade in crochet. 
So this is a piece from our um, summer collection that uh, contains also bikini uh, that are made in uh, Pima Cotton and uh, handmade um, by um, a community that, uh, um, of a woman. So what we didn't say um, until now is that uh, uh, most of our artisans are women. I think 100% are women, yes. Um, and then we have uh, for the winter and um, uh, um, product in uh, alpaca, like scarves, accessories, and uh, aiming to integrate uh, for the next uh, winter also with the jumper and the other products. And also we have some uh, piece in the for kids because uh, alpaca being in um, hypoallergenic fiber is very suitable for kids and baby, newborn. So here's about uh, what we have done uh, since our uh, launch. And actually, we started as an e-commerce uh, in October 2000, 2021. And we have some experiences in Milano Fashion Week. Uh, for example, in February 2022, we were invited in, in, the, um, in the sustainable part of the Milano Fashion Week. In, do you remember how was, what was the name? Uh, White, white, yes, white sustainable. So um, we were also invited to the Green Fashion Week, which was a very nice experience and where we launched our summer collection. Um, we have some uh, presence in the in in outside countries like uh, like Europe and also in America. Um, we have started our first temporary shop uh, last summer, and nowadays. Uh, looking for new partnership, we have uh, met uh, Paolo and the fantastic community of Friends of the Air. So nowadays we have started uh, this uh, this uh, new career, and, and we are happy to to participate. So um, this is our nowadays our projects. Uh, we hope to come to come up with new with new collections, always uh, in the frame of the slow fashion. Um, yeah, and that's it till now. Yes, some testimonial and the contact, uh, maybe in the next slide. Yes, uh, here uh, there our, are, our, there are um, some testimonials. Uh, you, if you go to our uh, YouTube uh, channel, we can you can see all the whole process of how yeah, maybe they are done. Some uh, interviews with our community of artisans and in our YouTube channel. Um, yeah, and the next slides that are our oh, website okay. and uh, our Instagram, Facebook uh, pages and uh, the YouTube channel. So please follow us and support our, our project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Roberto. For We wanted to bring uh, Alpaca here to show, but it was a bit complicated, right? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, okay, but they look like very friendly, right? Yes. Yes. Are they are they the one that spit or? No, it's no. the Jama. This is Jama. <laughs> the alpaca don't spit. What do they do? They something worse or? <laughs> okay, great, <laughs> wonderful, great to have you here and. Uh, Again, for those of you interested, you can uh, get in touch with them uh, and speak later during the um, the cocktail. So the next speaker uh, is uh, Lauren Amelia of uh, Rêve du Rive. Is she here? Hi. Oh, great. How are you? Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Well, I would like to thank the World Sustainability Organization for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, Anne and Paolo, thank you so much. And uh, for approving my product as a sustainable designer. For me, launching in 2014, that was a big deal because 
while being a founder and designer of the brand located in Geneva. My first collection was launched uh, after the birth of my first son. So as you can imagine, it was very stressful. <laughs> and Geneva really inspired my story. Um, the story unfolded when I nestled in this beautiful city. It was so captivating. The, with the lakeside allure, it served as a perfect backdrop for this inception of swimwear. The serene waters of Lake Geneva to the vibrant city life and every aspect of the sophisticated and the equality that the city provides. Launching the company, the brand, I had two priorities. So the first one was that I used fabric that was helpful to the world environment, meaning either it was taken from the water, which in this case my fabric was, is, or it was upcycled. However, I did it this way. The company that I use, they take the recycled materials from the oceans, they clean it, they respin it into this beautiful swimwear fabric. And my second one was to have full control over manufacturing. For me, manufacturing and sustainability go hand in hand. When you go overseas, you factor in, it's getting shipped over, it's going through the water. And in most cases, it's going back through the water. So I was trying to, well, I have succeeded to maintain these two factors in the brand today. And the brand is based in Geneva, but we do our, we have our own facility of manufacturing in France right over the border. So I'm very happy about that. <laughs> so as I embarked on the journey of opening the manufacturing facility where our swimsuits are meticulous, meticulously crafted, every garment is a labor of love for us. And we design and design and hand sewn using premium Italian fabrics, sustainable materials. And I applaud my team daily for their passion and hard work. It takes a tribe to reach our goals and I'm grateful to have them as my colleagues to make all of this beautiful, what she's wearing, come true. Our mission transcends mere fashion. Rev de Reeve aims to empower individuals to embrace their uniqueness and beauty through each curated collection. Moreover, our commitment to sustainability underscores our dedication to a greener, cleaner, and allowing our customers to feel proud of their contribution to environmental com conservation. At Rev de Reeve Swimwear, we believe that swimwear embodies a timeless elegance that transcends seasons, offering a diverse range of 46 styles to cater to every swimwear need and fit, because we all have different body shapes, <laughs> and ensuring our customers feel confident and stylish and all, all year round in their everyday swim needs. And of course, we have more coming soon. So thank you for joining us on this journey as we redefine the essence of swimwear, creating pieces that evoke a sense of eternal beauty and grace designed to accompany you on every sun-kissed adventure. And thank you for being part of our story. And I hope you enjoy this. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, actually, this product uh, and this um, swimwear has been uh, one of the best sellers in the store. Very successful uh, towards the end of the last summer when we first put them out. And uh, I have a question for you. Okay. How would you translate uh, Rêve de Rive in English? To dream on shore. Okay. How dream on shore. Translated to dream next to water, next to a body of water, whether it's the lake as per my inspiration or an ocean that inspires you or anything that makes you dream. Okay, wonderful. And uh, I, I've been living in uh, Geneva for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was one of the few actually going to the beach, you know, there's a little beach. And uh, it was really like a challenge to 
jump in the water, <laughs> at least for an Italian used to the Mediterranean Sea in the summer. It was uh, extremely refreshing, but it was really a challenge. And you counted, OK, I managed the three seconds, four seconds, and you have to go out because otherwise, is it it? Is it still like that, or it's a bit warmer now? You never go, tell the truth. No, no, we do go. We do go. Um, but I would say next to the shore itself, it might be a little bit warmer. But if you go out on the boat into the center of the lake, it's really where it's beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> great, thank you so much. Thank you. It's so great to have you here. Thank you. So we're coming towards the end of the show. We have Daniela uh, Spielman uh, for uh, Zoe Close. Daniela, hi. Welcome back. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, you're Zoe, you're right. Well, why did they write uh, Daniela Spielman? Okay, hello people. Don't worry, my presentation is quite short because um, I really wish that you can see in the collection I'm creating my big passion. Um, the model is wearing a whole outfit and me too. And um, I have just one slide. It's a video. Uh, it's important that you see it first before I start it, my presentation. As you can see, we have quite a big problem. It's underwater, which not everyone can see. And then um, it's plastic waste. And 48% of this plastic waste is this, this, all these fishing nets. Um, it's called it ghost gears because it's floating in the water without control. And these nets are from illegal fishing or from fishes which lost them. And the problem is that they are they fishing and fishing and fishing and it's never stopping. And so a lot of animals are dying in these nets. And the other problem is that these um, nets are going to the ground and they rode after four to 600 years. So they, they are in the water nearly 600 years. And also this microplastic animal eat that plastic. So indirectly, we also eat that. And then... Um, 
actually, this was the reason I started with my collection. And I'm producing an active wear, which is uh, for active sport. And since half a year, I have also started a lounge wear, which is, for example, I have this scarf uh, with me today. And um, I have for women, for women and for men. My collection is for both. And um, a main part for me was also I produce in Switzerland. So my whole collections are made in Switzerland. And at the moment, I'm in a process to get a really nice label, which is called Swiss Made. And yeah, that's my way. And I hope uh, you liked it. And that's my fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Zoe, and uh, it's great to have you here. And the, the supplier of the raw material, I think, is from Italy, right? Yeah, it's from, right? Um, it's from Italy, and uh, it's called Econil. Maybe you have heard before from that. And um, as you can see, they produce quite different material in the end. So it's really interesting, and really, I use all. Only Econil, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And it's also an invitation for everybody to do sports, go to the gym and move. It's good and healthy. So <clears throat> when, uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, a newcomer. We have uh, an increasing uh, interest uh, from uh, Kosovo in, uh, in our Friend of the Earth project. We already have a, a, a great brand which uh, is doing upcycling, which is available and present also on our, on our um, um, uh, Sustainable Friends concept store. Uh, the, the, the name, somebody can remind me the name? Kaone, Kaone, yes. And it's actually uh, uh, addressing Dua Lipa, right? Which uh, apparently is a very famous uh, singer. Everybody knows. I'm the only one still listening to Bob Dylan and this kind of stuff. So anyway, uh, he's a very famous uh, designer. And, uh, and now we had uh, uh, any, um, more uh, designers uh, being involved in the project from uh, Kosovo. And uh, the next speaker is uh, right online. I can see you. Hello, we can see you. Uh, Hi, can you also hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Hi. Miriam, yes, I read the, the name is, is, uh, is a new name for it. Yep. You can tell us the pronunciation. You can introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about uh, the project. And we are looking forward to have you in Milan. I know you joined and the different brands joined only uh, recently. But uh, uh, we look forward to have you in Milan and prepare also for the next steps. And uh, I believe also the Fashion Week in September. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Pranans Mirishahe. It's a traditional Albanian name. Uh, I don't know if you can see the presentation. Just a technical question. OK. So I'm actually because... today. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, first of all, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And it was an honor to hear all of these wonderful stories of people really changing the way how we think about fashion and how we are uh, working towards improving um, the way fashion is uh, manufactured and um, being more careful towards nature. Uh, I'm representing actually a developing project in Kosovo, which is fostering employment and growth opportunities. Um, it's a project that it's for the first time in Kosovo is working on um, also with the apparel sector. And the thing that we are trying to push forward is sustainable fashion. So it's really glad to be part of this and understand what's happening in like a global level. Uh, what we are doing, uh, of course, having in mind always um, economic development, sustainable economic development, is that we are trying to have more and more uh, fashion brands and um, MSMEs in Kosovo uh, produce uh, locally, sustainably, and also um, employ more people and just uh, grow. 
uh, the project, FEGO project, is implemented by Swiss Contact, which is a Swiss international organization. Uh, and we have our um, objectives that we are trying to reach. One of them uh, is also, uh, as I said, working towards sustainable fashion. And to do that, we are working with World Sustainability Organization, specifically with Friend of the Earth um, program, certification program. Uh, our organization have a few um, has actually three main projects. One of them being FEGO project, PPC, and also now a new project uh, focused on education. Uh, I will not go through everything about our project. I know we are a bit late as well. Our main sectors are furniture, apparel, and rural tourism. Um, we don't see the presentation moving. Are you? Yeah, I am. Okay, right now. Yeah, now we see it. Okay. 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 Uh, so some of our outputs of the project, uh, where we actually, we actually uh, are working together with a World Sustainability Organization, uh, are to have to improve market linkages for the because we are working for the private sector in Kosovo, so, so we are trying to help them improve market linkages and have access to B two B networks and services and also improve access to sales and channels. This would be like a way for these um, uh, private, for the businesses to, to want to join um, new initiatives such as this with uh, sustainable fashion. Uh, our project plays a facilitative role. And uh, since we already have a partnership agreement with World Sustainability Organization, um, WSO is the one that will actually implement the, the project. Um, we have already been working for two years uh, in Kosovo, and we have helped businesses in different uh, in different uh, initiatives, different ways. Some of them have been also uh, building capacity um, and establishing market linkages, um, and uh, some of them also in improving business uh, environment. Uh, it has also been on certification and marketing, which is where uh, our partnership with WSO falls as well. Um, Let's not go through all of this. Uh, regarding the skilled workforce and the training we have provided, uh, can you see the slide? I don't think you can see this one. Yeah, we can see the third slide, if you move it uh, forward. Now you're back to the second uh, where outline is written. Uh, I'm actually on the 11th slide right now. So. Wow. Because I'm skipping uh, some of the slides uh, about the project. Maybe not uh, okay. Now we are on FEGO objective. Let's go to the 11th on skilled workforce. Yeah. You're going. Yeah. Undici. Okay. Uh, here. So okay. we have we have been working in training, especially women from different communities in Kosovo, uh, in tailoring skills and other unnecessary skills uh, for them to be able to get uh, decent employment. And this has also helped uh, businesses, of course, um, in their manufacturing. Because one of the things that was mentioned during the some of the brand's presentation was also the importance of manufacturing process and we are trying to do that uh, locally and uh, all the manufacturing that is currently being done um, like in places like Turkey or uh, in some other places we are trying to bring that back in Kosovo and for that we are preparing um, a skilled workforce. Also we are uh, fostering B2B partnerships and also helping businesses uh, in the financing models. Some of these businesses that we have uh, supported uh, are also being considered for um, a sustainable certification. Um, we are trying to mostly work with um, sustainable machinery as well, and all that is um, uh, all that is actually uh, required or needed to have sustainable production for these businesses. Uh, as you can see here, for some of the results, uh, I'm on the slide uh, 13. You're still on skilled for workforce. Now, fostering. Okay, maybe I am not doing this. Uh -huh. Now it's okay. Fego results. Ah, okay. Fego okay. results. Now I get it. Okay, so what we have done until now for this 
first two years because this is still the beginning of our project and as i said since it's the first of its kind in kosovo we are still in our in the beginning and uh, trying to understand how um uh, trying to understand how we can uh, make more sustainable fashion uh so we have supported expected results actually are to support at least 150 uh, micro and small manufacturing businesses uh, and 30 startup businesses. Until uh, now, everything is going according to the plan. Uh, fortunately, Kosovo, it's a new country and has mostly young population, uh, but it's growing rapidly, uh, especially in the apparel sector. More and more businesses are being established, more and more businesses are uh, ex exporting, uh, producing. Um, so we are trying to um, create an environment that can be uh, more sustainable for this uh, for these uh, growing businesses. Uh, one of the things that it's very important to us uh, is this partnership with WSO, um, and this partnership is actually um, sorry. I just need to. Yep. Uh, this is actually uh, an exciting collaboration uh, because our idea is to our idea is to revolutionize the fashion industry in Kosovo, fashion industry in Kosovo, uh, and to just bring together the expertise of two, both organizations. Um, and as Kosovo's fashion industry uh, is, as I said, it's growing rapidly, uh, the need for sustainable and environmentally uh, responsible practices has become increasingly evident. Uh, therefore, this collaboration uh, arises from this joint commitment of uh, WSO and FAGO to address this evolving uh, dynamics of the Kosovo fashion sector and is trying to balance the expansion with the dedica dedication on, um, and focus on sustainability. Um, sorry, it's a bit complicated with this. Okay, next slide. Uh, as you have mentioned, already mentioned, Kaona is one of the businesses from Kosovo that has already been part of the Milan Fashion Week. We also, from FEGO project, uh, had the pleasure to be there uh, last time during the um, uh, Kaona's presentation. Uh, what's important to mention maybe is that Kosovo has really rich cultural diversity um, and what we are witnessing is also an evolution in fashion industry. Uh, we are trying to combine uh, this, um, this cultural diversity with new uh, ways of making fashion um, and we are trying to encourage this, these fashion businesses in Kosovo um, to embrace sustainability in this process. Uh, Kaon is one of the examples, however, we have already identified at least 30 other businesses in Kosovo that have potential to be uh, certified for sustainable fashion, but we are still, since we are in the beginning of our partnership as well, um, WSO will engage a third party audit to actually see if any of those uh, businesses have potential to be certified. However, the idea is to at least present this um, new perspective into making fashion and just to understand um, this uh, certification uh, how to say as a new way of, of thinking and also understanding that uh, you can make fashion and enter new markets uh, and grow um, without harming the environment. Uh, these are some pictures of uh, some businesses in Kosovo that uh, are producing upcycling and recycling. Uh, the first one is actually uh, quite a known brand now in Kosovo that WSO is considering uh, for uh, certification. Um, some of the other details that this partnership with WSO includes are also uh, marketing opportunities in Milan, which is really a great opportunity for businesses coming from Kosovo as a small country. Um, and then also participation in international affairs and, uh, as I already mentioned, third-party audit support. Um, we are trying to establish a system for identifying and certifying fa fashion businesses in Kosovo. And since we already started identifying the first ones, we hope that this will be something that will continue in the future as well. Um, the idea is to actually enable uh, Kosovo's fashion businesses uh, to not only, uh, how to say, 
adhere to sustainable uh, to sustainability, but also be able to thrive and expand on international scale. That's why also marketing and access to new markets it's included in this partnership. Uh, so the whole idea of this collaboration, uh, from which we are hoping that we will have more and more businesses in, in the future who will not need FAGO project as a facilitator, but who will actually seek themselves uh, such certifications, um, is to address these critical issues, um, such as some of them already mentioned very um, de uh, in details about from other brands, uh, such as industry growth, global globalization, customer awareness, strategic collaborations, international exposure, uh, and overall, which is also the whole uh, the main um, focus of our project, is uh, sustainable economic development. Um, so the idea is to understand and to recognize that sustainable practices are not just an ethical choice, but the necessity uh, to mitigate environmental impact. And I think that uh, fashion industry is something we can actually uh, use, how to say, to raise awareness on such issues uh, and also to change the way how, how we do it. Um, so WSO, we already know, brings this global recognition and credibility to the collaboration while we as FAGO project are providing uh, our insights uh, and into the unique challenges and also opportunities that come uh, from uh, Kosovo fashion industry. Um, and we believe that since we have so many um, very talented uh, students in Kosovo, design students, very young entrepreneurs, uh, so many businesses now, um, uh, as you already mentioned, sometimes dressing even some of the global um, celebrities. So it's really uh, a rapidly growing uh, market and uh, we have a lot of potential. So this would be the way to, uh, to go. Uh, the whole goal or the main goal of this uh, collaboration so is to catalyze transformative change within Kosovo fashion industry to provide businesses with tools recognition and knowledge to thrive sustainably sustainably in an increasingly con conscious and global fashion landscape uh, and we are hoping that we can actually uh, build a future that would serve both uh, businesses would impact or would um, uh, how to say, help businesses grow, create more employment, have more sustainable economic development, but also um, just as a main idea, just change the way how we think about fashion and um, think of ourselves not only as, um, how to say, customers, but also as agents of change and just um, uh, be more conscious about how, how we live. Uh, once again, this is our project and this is our uh, partnership with WSO. This is what you're trying to uh, achieve. I'm just really glad to be part of this presentation today and just get uh, to hear all of those stories. Uh, I'm sure that we will do a great job together in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, big applause from uh, the audience. And uh, uh, what you're doing in Kosovo is, is, is great. And also the, the great objectives that you have for the coming year. And we are glad to have you in the project. We look forward to start uh, collaborating in real now that we close the, the, the agreement, the collaboration agreement. Thank you again so much. And um, I, uh, we, are, we are right on time. Um, I have just a, a few uh, wrapping up slides. Um, maybe... You, Se puoi mettere la lo slide, uh, il PowerPoint. Okay. Well, I just mentioned some of the brands that are not here uh, today uh, for several technical reasons, like uh, Natural Cotton Color from Brazil, uh, who is uh, uh, using uh, cotton, which is uh, not uh, 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 dyed. Uh, it is naturally colored in that way with different uh, shades. Uh, on the on the plant, uh, it's uh, produced in agroforestry and uh, with a very limited use of uh, water and helping the local communities. All these brands uh, are uh, available also at our concept store. Some of them, as you can see, are from Brazil. Some are using the cotton color, the sorry, the cotton from natural cotton color, and uh, 
is uh, another very interesting brand. You can actually see some of the looks uh, uh, at the cocktail where we will go in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is uh, Pacoa Eco, which uses uh, a waste from uh, banana processing uh, to make shoes. And Tropica also with uh, wonderful uh, recycled cotton or uh, cotton from natural cotton color. And uh, my, sli my last slide is, is just summing up uh, some of the major points about what we um, uh, discussed today. Uh, the, the, the fashion industry is, is very important for our well-being, just like uh, we need to eat, we need also to dress. And uh, uh, however, this production has grown exponentially, especially since the year 2000 with fast fashion. And uh, all fibers have pros and cons. And uh, we should, uh, at least our mission, and I think everybody's mission of everybody that is here in the room today is to minimize their impact. And uh, um, we need to also raise awareness, inform consumers through the media and different means uh, about the lower impact alternatives, such as uh, upcycling, low fashion, sustainable, all the things that we have seen today. And uh, in, in this uh, big confusion of uh, claims, self-claims, uh, some greenwashing, a third-party certification is very important uh, because it allows consumers to make a really a responsible choice. They are demanding it, actually. And uh, Friend of the Earth, among other certification, uh, is, is, is part of the sustainable fashion movement, also thanks to your interest and involvement. So this said, I would like uh, to thank also all uh, those of uh, my team which helped to organize all this. In particular, and I'm afraid to forget some of them, but uh, uh, Naomi and Etome, the project manager, who we will meet downstairs. Uh, Chiara, thank you. Uh, Chiara uh, Glisenti, who is, I think is still here with us. Uh, and uh, uh, Jessica, who helped also in uh, dealing uh, and coordinating the models, everybody, the administration, Nikki, Reze, and uh, also those who made the outreach to uh, the companies to get them involved, uh, such as Annabelle, Michela, and, uh, you know, forgive me if I forgot somebody, uh, Sarah, who is organizing the interviews at the at the, um, the store with people involved in uh, sustainable uh, sustainability in general. And uh, so I thank also the Centro Culturale of Milan to help us organize this, and in particular Pino, who has been uh, essential <laughs> for us. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so before we go to have a cocktail, a refreshment, and network, uh, at uh, floor minus one, uh, possibly try to use the stairs because the elevator otherwise get uh, too crowded. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, we are uh, here available. Has anybody got any specific question to the to the speakers or to me? I, I suspect that you're all very tired, but you know, while I speak, if you want to raise your hand, we still have time because we are not basically late. We were planning to have the cocktail at five. Uh, I think uh, it was, uh, even for me, who have basically been in contact with all the brands, etc., but to actually see them alive and learn from there directly about their experience, I really uh, got some uh, very useful uh, insights. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to see also this uh, great diversity among uh, the brands that have been involved from different continents, different stories, upcycling, organic, uh, different opinions, and, uh, but all, all of them very consistent in what they do. And the certification, I think, uh, provides uh, further assurance in, in this regard. So um, feel free to contact me or to contact uh, Naomi for the project. Uh, 
uh, and uh, all our team later on today or in the next days. Thank you very much. And don't forget, don't forget to, I think the turn is off. Don't forget to visit our Sustainable Friends concept store in Galleria Passarella 1 and to like us on the social and also on the Google business of the store. Thank you so much. Have a great day and see you downstairs at the cocktail if you wish. <laughs>